Hi, I'm Keir Simmons, and welcome to the Royal Rundown. It's been one year since Queen Elizabeth passed away after more than 70 years on the throne. But there will be no official public events in the UK to commemorate her passing. In fact, King Charles plans to spend the day not here at Buckingham Palace, but, quote, quietly and privately in Scotland. The last 12 months for the King have been anything but quiet. Nearly everything changed from the life he knew just 12 months ago. Over the next half hour, we'll explore those changes. Plus, what's to come for the rest of the royal family? William and Kate, how will they evolve the future monarchy? And what can we hope to see from other members moving forward? We'll answer all that, but first, let's recap the last year and give you a royal rundown of where the monarchy was and is today. Take a look. This morning, marking a year since her passing, the palace releasing this picture of Queen Elizabeth aged 42, chosen by her son and heir. King Charles and Queen Camilla attending a private memorial in Scotland, while the Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, heading to a separate service in Wales. Prince Harry in town for a charity event last night. I know exactly one year on that she is looking down on all of us tonight. Overnight, King Charles releasing an audio message to mark his mother's passing one year ago. We recall with great affection her long life, devoted service and all she meant to so many of us. The Queen's passing was a moment in history, the closing of a 70-year-long royal chapter. Her dedication to duty evident to the end. During her final days, she appointed a new Prime Minister, her family, her nation, and the world knew this day would come, but many seemed unprepared. I think in many ways, the announcement of the Queen's death 12 months ago was a deep shock to most Brits, even though she was in her mid-90s, even though we knew that she'd uh, had failing health because of what it stood for, because of how it made us all feel about our place in the world and how she had been this continuity for most of our lifetimes. God save the King. Since that day, it's been quite a year. Prince Charles became King Charles. His son and their wives reunited briefly. Then the funeral, full of the pomp and ceremony of days past, attended by world leaders and ordinary people whose lives she touched. Though it seemed like everyone had their own special memory. The King's new role brought many unfamiliar moments, each one poignant as the last with the Queen missing. This his first state banquet as monarch, and it has brought new responsibilities for other royals, most notably William and Kate, now Prince and Princess of Wales. I think we've definitely seen William and Kate stepping into the limelight, taking centre stage, sharing the stage, of course, with Camilla and with Charles, but certainly being very, very pivotal. They travelled to the US to award their Earthshot Prize, a successful trip, but overshadowed by one of King Charles' first crises, new allegations of racism in Buckingham Palace, vehemently denied by the royal family. And as the royals prepared for Christmas, Harry and Meghan delivered an unwelcome gift. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. Their Netflix show making headlines, causing more controversy for the new King Charles. I said that we need to get out of here. Who's next? And in the new year, another scandal. The publication of Prince Harry's book, Spare, with private details of royal life and even an allegation of a physical altercation with his brother. The King's sons far from united under his reign. Thankfully for Charles, the coronation was staged without a hitch. God save the King! God save the King! Harry attending, though without Meghan, and Camilla for the first time referred to as Queen rather than Queen Consort. The balcony moment framing a new, scaled down royal family, with the younger generation, William and Kate's children, George, Charlotte, and Louis very much in the spotlight. Prince Andrew unequivocally on the outside after scandals that have not disappeared. For King Charles, it has been a far from easy year, but then stepping into his mother's role, who made everything seem so easy, was never going to be without challenges. Her legacy of hard work, duty, and quiet continuity seems alive in her air, though there will never be a monarch quite like her again. 
My goodness, so much has changed with this family and with the family business. And there's no one better to help us break it down than royal commentator Daisy McAndrew. Hey, Daisy. How are you? So, uh, King Charles will, uh, this year, mark his mother's passing privately. Do you think that's a tradition he's going to continue? Yes, I think all the signs are pointing in that direction. We know that the Queen used to do the same thing. On February the 6th, the anniversary of her father's death, she would be in Sandringham where he had died on that day, quietly thinking about him, uh, collecting her thoughts, a private day away from the scrutiny of the public. And that's certainly what we think Charles will continue to do after this year. Go to the place, uh, Balmoral in this instance, where his mother died um, and have no public engagements, be there with his wife Camilla thinking about the past year and thinking about the Queen. It's been a roller coaster year for the King in so many ways. What are the key moments, uh, the key changes, if you like, this past 12 months that you would pick out? Well, of course, I think once the dust had settled from the coronation, which was the big event formally marking uh, his accession to the throne, after that, it was really all eyes on Charles to see what he might change and what he might uh, keep the same as before. And I think some people have been surprised that it's been more of a continuity reign um, than any dramatic changes. And certainly those around him are saying that's what he wanted. He didn't want to frighten the horses in some ways, but start the hard work of changing things from the inside out. Some people slightly disappointed that there haven't been uh, more shake-ups. For instance, um, a lot of people expected by now we would have heard that some of the buildings, like Buckingham Palace, might have become uh, more open to the public. Yeah. So far, little action on that. Yeah, scaled down royal family. Where's that right now, right? And on that issue, the scaled down royal family, of course, we have seen some moves behind the scenes to try to cut things down, slim down uh, the scale and the expense, namely trying to evict his brother Andrew from yeah. Royal Lodge in Windsor. Um, other things, though, I think we've seen him embrace some of the issues that he wants to be known for. We've got a big project coming forward uh, where he's trying to affect food waste, reducing food waste. And that's one of those issues. It's not party political, so it's not controversial, but it's clearly something that aligns with the king's own morals and, and things he feels passionately about. Do you think the public here are warming to him? I do. There have been a couple of polls in the last few weeks. There's been an Ipsos Mori one, there's been a YouGov one, um, asking people how, if at all, their opinion has changed uh, of the royals and of Charles in particular in the last year. And both of those polls have been quite positive. They have shown an uptick in popularity as ever, it's the younger demographic that he's got an issue with, and yeah. I think we'll see more in the coming months and years trying to appeal to those people. What about the younger royals, the box office members of the royal family, if you like, William and Kate and their children? How have they been doing in the past year and what do you think we're going to see from them? We've seen more of them, which is exactly what we expected all along. Of course, William now being you know, the, the heir to the throne, being uh, the Prince of Wales and Catherine being the Princess of Wales. And we have seen them really take centre stage. You and I have talked a lot over the past couple of years um, expecting that to happen, that it would be a foursome really of Kate, William, Camilla, Charles, who would be at the helm of this family. And I think that's exactly what we've seen. Thank you, Dave. And after the break, the Prince and Princess of Wales, right in the centre of the spotlight, as we were just talking about. What responsibilities have they taken over from King Charles? And what we will see now of their littlest, the members of the royal family. That's all coming up.
Welcome back to the Royal Rundown. Queen Elizabeth's death established Prince William as the heir apparent to the British throne. He's already taken on this new role with ease, but there will be more duties in the years ahead for him, his wife and their children. NBC's Kelly Kobiea has more. Take a look. After the Queen's passing last year, the line of succession shifted for the monarchy, bringing new responsibilities for members of the royal family and new titles for William and Kate, the Prince and Princess of Wales. With the world watching, the Prince and Princess have stepped into their new roles. Our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations. The two holding multiple titles, which is quite typical for the royal family, also known as the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge. William takes over as the Duke of Cornwall from his father, traditionally held by the eldest son of the reigning British monarch, inheriting the Duchy of Cornwall, an estate that includes more than 130,000 acres of land worth over a billion dollars. While William and Kate have always been among the most beloved royals, their actions now carry more significance than ever. It's said that the Queen brought her son Charles into the fold on official matters, a blueprint he'll likely replicate to prepare William for his eventual reign. I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set. Royal watchers expect King Charles will rely heavily on his eldest son as both an advisor and an extension of the crown. As their royal roles evolve, the Prince and Princess of Wales will continue to champion causes close to them, like the environment. It's my hope the Earthshot legacy will continue to grow, helping our communities and our planet to thrive. Mental health. Catherine Harrow launched this campaign uh, last year, and extremely proud. Ending homelessness with the launch of Homewards and early childhood development. Does it make you feel better when you talk about your feelings? Yeah. As seen in the launch of Princess Kate's campaign, Shaping Us, earlier this year. And although Prince William won't receive any formal training to one day be king, it's a job he's been preparing for his whole life. His lessons in kingship started by his grandmother's knee, and he has had in both his grandmother and his father great mentors. William, Kate, and their family represent a new chapter in the monarchy. You look at Kate and William, a young, working couple with a young family juggling the school run with their interests, with Kate and her early learning, with William and his environmental awards. You can see that they are meant to be not dissimilar to us, therefore we should and could and hopefully will feel a connection to them. This shift brings about change for William and Kate's children as well. Prince George, now second in line for the throne, followed by his sister, Princess Charlotte, and brother, Prince Louis. We've seen much more of the children than usual over the last year, from the coronation to Wimbledon. They are the future. Kate will one day be a big part of a future coronation, as will George. And I think any reminders to the British public, this is the future. The future of the royal family is in safe and popular hands. That's very valuable. All eyes will be on the Prince and Princess of Wales as they continue to settle into their new roles, marking the beginning of a new era for the royal family. The Prince and Princess of Wales are, are not the only ones at work, with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex stepping down as senior royal members and the Queen's passing, there have been more family members representing the Crown at events and charitable organisations. Take a look. As the royal family and the British nation adjusted to life without Queen Elizabeth II. The ability to have somebody who is kind of epitomises what you think your country stands for has always been a major ambition. A group of royals moved closer to centre stage, most notably the King's siblings, Princess Anne and Prince Edward, who were named councillors of the state by King Charles, giving them the power to stand in the King's place in the event that he is unwell or unable to fulfil a particular duty. Princess Anne was the first to return to royal duties at the start of 2023, one of her first trips of the year to Cyprus, meeting with British peacekeepers and paying tribute to Commonwealth soldiers who died at war. The Princess Royal had a very busy spring, 
travelling to New Zealand, where she met the first responders in the wake of a cyclone that hit the country. Visiting the Wellington barracks to meet and thank officers participating in King Charles's coronation and paying tribute to veterans at the National Memorial Arboretum. But one of Princess Anne's most memorable moments was, of course, receiving a special role in the coronation of King Charles III. She served as gold stick in waiting, a role similar to a bodyguard, and led the grand royal procession from Westminster Abbey to Buckingham Palace. Anne's brother, Prince Edward, started the year with a major moment, inheriting his late father's title of Duke of Edinburgh on his 59th birthday, while his wife, Sophie, became Duchess. Thank you very much indeed for uh, welcoming us to, uh, to Edinburgh today on indeed a very special and, uh, and, and for a slightly overwhelming day for, for now my wife and Duchess. <laughs> The Duke and Duchess attended their first event with their new titles, meeting with members of the Ukrainian community at Edinburgh's city chambers to mark one year since the city's formal response to the invasion of Ukraine. He also became patron of the Duke of Edinburgh Award in his father's place and hosted a meeting with 10 award participants. And there will be future generations of people turning up here for the awards thinking that I was responsible for this, but it's not true. It was indeed my father and visited the May Murray Foundation in Ireland, helping people of all ages and abilities participate in water activities. You're going in, and just, just for a swim, or do you like going on the surfboard? I'm going on the surfboard. You're going on the surfboard. Prince Edward's wife, Sophie, has followed in the footsteps of her late father-in-law, Prince Philip, by choosing agriculture and farm life as one focus area of her official work. Earlier this year, she was named president of the Driffield Agricultural Society and even became the first UK royal ever to visit Baghdad in an effort to support women and gender equality around the world. Though left with huge shoes to fill, it seems those royals, once waiting in the wings, are stepping into the spotlight. Only time will tell if this trend continues or King Charles has something else up his sleeve for the future. Coming up, we switch gears to the Invictus Games. Prince Harry's beloved charitable event kicks off tomorrow in Germany. Stay with us. Welcome back. While Prince Harry has stepped away from his royal duties, his charitable efforts are still in full swing. Supporting wounded veterans is still very close to his heart. In fact, the Invictus Games kicks off this weekend in Germany. 
Last year, he invited our very own Hoda Kotb to the Games in the Netherlands and gave her a behind-the-scenes look at what the event is all about. Take a look. Stop it. Wait, the gang's all here? Come here. I need to see y'all. The wiggly toes. <laughs> Both Prince Harry and the Rodriguez family know just how important a support system is. Let's go! Don't stop it! And this is the pep squad for Joel Rodriguez, a U.S. Army retired staff sergeant. Yes! Yes! Is it fun watching your dad? Yes. <gasps> He's super fast. Yes. How fast is he? Like, he could go 30 miles per hour. <laughs> Whoa! To son Elijah, 10-month-old daughter Layla, and his wife Liani, Joel is a superhero. What is he teaching your kids? He definitely is teaching them to get up every day, to work hard, to go after everything that you want, right? And um, stick to it no matter what happens, wins, losses, whatever, just keep going in life. Prior to 2014, Joel was a passionate Army sergeant, but a devastating car accident not only derailed Joel's Army career, but left him with a fractured neck and a severe spinal cord injury. A lot of people would have thought these are the cards I'm dealt. This is what I get, and I have to live with this. And maybe, maybe I've taken it kind of slowly through life. You did the total opposite, man. You went all the way in. You said cards, and that's funny because when my wife came to see me in um, probably a day after my surgery, she was like, are you okay? I said, well, these are the cards I have, so I have to play them. <laughs> and I said, so I'm just going to do what I can to be the best person I can in this situation. And I mean, it's, I'm still doing it. That's, that's all we can do. What does it mean to watch uh, these guys and women just shine like this? As far as I'm concerned, they've shone throughout their careers anyway, right? You know, to be able to see Joel and his family just flourish in moments like this, it means everything. But it comes back to the very simple thing, which is this, the power of sport. Mm. You know, not just physical, but the, the mental rehabilitation that it takes is, is phenomenal. And Joel is in good company, surrounded by 500 competitors from 19 nations, where camaraderie and resilience are celebrated at the Invictus Games, like retired military petty officer Jacob Cox. Awesome. <laughs> I want you to have yeah. those. Wait, these really are for me? Yes, those are for you. Just, just because? Just because. <laughs> I want you to have them. Is that okay? That was really nice. Thank you. Oh my God, that was so sweet. For Jacob, who is visually impaired, the 100 meter is an incredible feat. I'm legally blind, so I run with a blindfold and a guide. Yeah, so. Holy moly. So my guide has to put in all the work <laughs> because he has to run his races and run them again for me. And retired Air Force Tech Sergeant Gonzalez, who suffered a head injury during a training exercise while on active duty. Retired in 2016 from the Air Force, um, severe PTSD, TBI, and other um, neurological ailments, and uh, wasn't able to function, wasn't able to do my job, and, you know, I could no longer serve, so, like, my whole world was over, my heart was broken, and I was suicidal, and then I saw uh, a video of the Invictus Games, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> I need to do what I can to find how to get involved. Competed in eight individual events, and I not only won, I won by 11 points. <laughs> and then a month later, they said, you got a spot on Team U.S. Okay, so. I can't, I can't. <laughs> For these athletes, the Invictus Games has played a part in their recovery, showing resilience goes beyond the battlefield. When we come back, Harry Smith looks back at the extraordinary life of Queen Elizabeth, woven through nearly a century of world history.
Welcome back. On February the 6th, 1952, 25-year-old Princess Elizabeth was traveling with her husband Philip in Kenya when she got a phone call with the news that her father, King George VI, had died and she would be the Queen of England. She held that title for over 70 years. We end the show with a look back at the Queen on the front row of a century of history. Here's Harry Smith. Now before you all, that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. When Elizabeth took the throne in 1953, her country didn't have enough food to feed itself. Yes, still recovering from World War II, Britain would not suspend food rationing for another year. Yet there she was, in a first, a worldwide telecast. Hers was a realm that was hungry for a monarch who might lead it into the modern world, a sovereign who could put shine back on the remnants of an empire that had sacrificed all it could. Her Majesty would do all that and more, of course. She was a queen who would be both regal on the throne and reliable as a rudder in stormy seas, both personal and political. We asked around the office, can you name another queen besides Queen Latifah and Aretha Franklin? Nobody. Thanks to shows like The Crown, we think we got a glance into royal responsibilities. There's a delicate matter which I felt I needed to discuss with you in person. Concerning what? Your position. Those meetings with the prime ministers? Wow. She saw them all. Fifteen of them, starting with Winston Churchill. And just days ago, Liz Truss. Look at her scrapbook of presidents. Harry Truman when she was a princess, riding horses with Ronald Reagan. Talk about a photo op. Elizabeth was a presence, both familiar and utterly unknowable. Gossip about the royal family is an industry in the UK. Here in the US, we hire royal watchers to help us divine the mysteries of Buckingham Palace and Balmoral Castle. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, wrote Shakespeare. Hers was a life both enviable and unescapable. Human, not divine. Our favorite images of Elizabeth? Her coming face to face with local folks at the opening of a who knows what. The work, as royals call it. Imagine meeting the queen. Untold thousands have. We loved the queen with her corgis. We liked her wearing wellies. We smiled when she smiled. And she smiled a lot when she watched a horse race, if she won. We were there when Her Majesty visited Washington, D.C. in 1991. The sometimes stuffy and self-involved city went gaga. Not a cynic in sight. Not bad for a monarch in a town and a country who long ago made it clear monarchy is not our thing. Really? For Sunday Today, Harry Smith, New York. A legacy that will live on forever. Thank you for joining me this half hour as we honor the anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's passing. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today All Day. probably went apple picking over the weekend and if you're thinking what am I gonna do with all of this fruit I'm sure you are so many apples we've got some ideas Jetila is here leading our master class Monday to teach us all about the different varieties of apples the best way to use them hi Jet hey what's happening uh, Savannah or uh, Jenna or say she's Bob Anyway, Bob, that's yeah. really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Sorry, She's known as Bob. <laughs> I'm that's Bob. What, you can call me Bob. Oprah calls her Bob. Yeah, just Oprah. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's that time of year, right? It's apple time, October, kind of all the way into 
<clears throat> January. Uh, you probably went to pick apples and you saw some at the store. Uh, I just want to take you through them on which ones to eat, which ones to cook yes. with, which ones can kind of oh, do that's both. Good to know. Can we just start I with cutting have, and peeling? Yeah, go ahead. Though? Can we cut and peel first? Because we don't know how to Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. Let's do that. Everyone should have one uh, a peeler. There's many different kinds. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the kinds that have a little serration on them. Uh -oh. So here's a little bit of serration. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not doing anything fancy. Uh, I, I, you know, it's like a game for me, that's right? Fancy. I try to do. That is, that's very try, fancy. No, it's not. Oh, you, you got, got a bruiser on that one, though. One and you didn't take oh, the sticker that? off. I like that you didn't waste no. time. You're just going straight in. What do you oh, do why? if you get I'm a bruisey also, apple like that? You bake it. You know what you do? You, you bake it very good. Or you just cut it off. You take a little piece and you go, chip, just oh, like that, wow, and it's gone, cool. right? And it's like a game. I try to make sure I that's get all, good. you know, get it all in one, mm -hmm. and, you know, then my kids can. Anyway, we compost that. Um, so that's how I cut and peel. Another tip I have for you is um, the way I get the most out of an apple is uh, I'll peel it, I'll cut it in half, and check out, here's a really good tip. I take a teaspoon, uh, and I'll actually use the teaspoon to remove the core. Oh, look and at the that. that but look at that, check it out. And I get the most amount of apple that way. Oh. I Somebody get zero just said waste. wow in our studio. Somebody that oh, very rarely very says wow. Anthony, was that you oh, over yeah. there? I actually impressed someone in there. Um, I'll cut this two ways today. So we're gonna do, I'm actually, I've made a apple compote, kind of a warm uh, a cinnamon brown yeah. sugar apples that'll go over a Dutch baby. And then we made a savory uh, situation, um, making a little bit of stuffing for an apple roulade. Uh, but I think we should talk about tasting apples, yeah, right? Okay. Um, so I break them down into two general categories. Uh, tart and crisp is good for cooking and you have a honey crisp uh, not a hand crisp, but you have a, a, a Gran Granny Smith yeah, granny. there, and that's green. Granny, tart and crisp. So Granny guys. is what we should cook with, right? I want you to cook with these, and look. I mean, look. I don't want to tell people what to do. If you it. love tart, then you do it. But I cook with Granny Smith. No, this is the best cooking apple. Really crisp, right? Really tight. Um, and then next to you, you'll probably have a Honey Honey Crisp or a Red Delicious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, granny Smith, tight, tart. Uh, red delicious, kind of mealy, good for snacking. The snacking apple, mm -hmm. and in between there's a Fuji, and a, and there's Much so many snacking. new varieties out there. Mm -hmm. um, so what so, about a so gala? that's a gala is uh, one of the uh, number of top five apples in the world. Oh. That's kind of good to go both ways, like a honey crisp, Who ranks these uh, but apples? also good for snacking. Um, you know apples. what? We we kind of just take the <laughs> info. Yeah, apples. Jet fuel is appleinfo.com. We kind of uh, just go by sales information. Oh. And they also come in these little ones. I put these in my kids' um, lunchbox every day. So you have okay. a snacking, a big size and a little size. Cute. Um, so. So yes, yeah. another thing you can do is you take the apples, you cook them down, and look what I've made. I've made a pork roulade here, yeah. and what I've done is I love apples and pork. So I've taken uh, the apples, I've taken cranberries, some 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 dressing there, and I'm show you how that works. So here's the piece of pork loin. Uh, you take the pork loin, and here's the dressing that I made, and, and you basically either uh, cut cut the uh, pork loin into a sheet, or you can actually just use a mallet if that's easier for you. Uh, you want to leave a little uh, room on the edge. And all we're going to do is I like to use uh, parchment paper yeah. uh, so I don't really have to be making too much contact. And look, I'm just lifting smart. and rolling, okay. lifting and rolling. And I haven't even touched the pork. Yeah. Check that out. So wow. you tie that. You tie that with a little bit of butcher twine. This is fancy. Um, I brown. I roast. Mm -hmm. It's really not that hard. Uh, the nice thing. And then you make one of those situations. Um, another really fun uh, deal is I actually take the apples and I cut them bigger and then just butter like butter and brown sugar and cinnamon makes yeah. everything mm. more delicious. So I love uh, a Dutch and then, baby too. Oh, and if you've never had a Dutch baby, guys? Is. Yeah, I love a Dutch it's baby. It's just like a large pancake. So take your Dutch baby. It basically poofs up in the oven really nice. big. And then I'm going to take the apple. Look at that. Look at that apple. Uh -huh. um, the warm Look apple that. Over there. Over ice cream, though, that would be yes. good too, right? You had me with Dutch oh. baby, Jet. This looks so delicious. Right? And then, uh, you know what, how you finish is always really important. So a yeah. ton I agree of powdered with you. sugar, ice mm -hmm. cream, whipped cream. Yes. Um, there it is. Go out, pick Jet. apples, eat apples, find a new variety every day, and then play with it and eat it. Thank you, Jet. Thank we you well. so much. <laughs> this morning on Today Food, quick and easy cooking is the name of the game. Mark Bittman is the best-selling author of over 30 cookbooks, and now he's out with a revised version of how to cook everything fast with all the recipes in the book, which everybody's raving about, by the way. Thank you. You're my favorite host. I what love can it. I say? Yay! All right, um, so we're gonna make ham okay. biscuits. Drop biscuits. Drop biscuits. You think they're hard? Most people do. I do. They're not. I mean, dough and all that's a lot. Right. So, so dough is flour and baking powder and baking right, soda and salt and pepper. Okay. You need chilled butter. Okay. That's um, the secret. 
Check, check, and check. Could be frozen even, okay. really. And um, you which, just want to. Oops. Blade are you using? You, you just want to use blade? the regular so steel blade. No oh. She's like, which blade are you using? I'm over here, like, okay, just push on. This is kind of chop that up. All right. And then you put. Do you have this to is have buttermilk. Do you have to have a... I mean, you could do this by hand, but we are trying to talk easy, <laughs> right? <laughs> so... I actually have one you of You don't have one of those? No, I'm proud of myself. I have one. Oh, and then you do it's this food until it looks like this. <laughs> okay. Okay? Done. And then you could use an ice cream scoop. You can use two spoons like to shape these, yeah. but I do this. Yeah. Oh, you don't have to roll it out or you get don't it? don't do any. So that's that's why they're called I drop I biscuits. I assumed it was, you know, you know, having to beat no, it and all drop that. Drop biscuits. And you want to keep them small because... They, they cook faster, mm. and then they stay beautifully crisp okay. like this on the outside. Okay. This is just a mixture of mustard and jam, That's apricot jam, Wait, you chutney. Mix mustard and jam? And then you get mm. this. How is that, guys? It's fantastic. So I good. mean, they're raving the ham, They are raving. So you do. Mustard. Is that a thing, mustard and jam? Yeah, it's, it's a, a thing. thing. It's a thing. That's right. a Bitman sauce. It's his thing. Any kind of ham or no? Well, any kind of good ham. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on okay. to the next thing. I'm going to try this while you start on that. So the next oh, thing yeah, we're going to make you, is apple. Good, or good. You eat a biscuit. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> oh! I yeah, know, right? Eat a biscuit. This that is good when you smack somebody's arm. I apologize. It's good, right? So good. Mm. All right, what are we making? So now? this is diced apples. Okay. I like to leave the skins on, actually, but these are off. But but uh, honey crisp and golden delicious. The but they can ones. be any mixture. Okay. And you're gonna saute those. So the idea of this is it's an apple crisp in two pans. Okay. So much easier and faster. Okay. While that's cooking, you add a little water so it doesn't burn. Just a little burn. bit of butter, and that's it, right? While that's cooking, we make like an apple crisp topping. How do we do that? So that's, let's do it in the right order. Okay. Oats. Check. Into the butter. Nice. Into, this is a fair amount oh, of butter. I know, you know, it looks so delightful. Oats. Oh, it's not low fat. Walnuts. Not walnuts. Okay. Coconut. Oh, okay. Coconut. That's what it is. Brown sugar. You guys didn't oh, see the sugar. taste of coconut in there? We'll have another biscuit. This mm. is. What is that, cinnamon? Yep. All right. And just a little Woo! bit of Got that one. A little bit of salt. And then just. Cook that until it's crisp, until it's like that. Okay, this is what it's So that's like. basically granola, so right? I bet you this by itself is delightful. Mm -hmm. I bet it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, have you tried this by itself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he has. Yes. <laughs> this is dangerous. Before I even get to the apple on top, I that's the problem. I it's make good. an apple crisp and I just eat all oh, the crisp. Oh, that's good. Right, and so this is, that. yeah, you know, we're going to. We're going to eat this afterwards, Mark, so fantastic. we got to do this. Okay. And so you wind up with something that looks like this, like this. Mm -hmm. or something that looks like this. Oh, we're making there. Can I and, try it um, now? <laughs> it's your how show, you, you know. How long do you um, do that? I mean, this is like five minutes, oh, seven. Oh, so quick. Yeah, yeah. Mm. We're going to cook this. You got 30 this cookbooks? So, this is why you have 30 cookbooks. <laughs> Do you know what would go so well with that cup of coffee you're having right okay, now? I know, I know. A oh, breakfast taco? What? No! A slice of warm, buttery oh, apple pie. There is nothing more classic or comforting this time of year. So we asked Maya Camille Broussard, she's the owner of Justice of the Pies, to share her best pie-making tips. Oh. Take a look. Oh my. We have three cups of flour. 
Then we're going to add some granulated sugar, some kosher salt, and we also need 16 tablespoons of really, really cold unsalted butter. And we're going to cut the butter into the flour. What you want to see is pea-sized shaped pieces of butter. And that butter is going to steam into the crust and pop up, and that's going to make it flaky. I always start off with a little bit of water, and then I add as I go along. All right, so once all of that comes together, then we essentially create a disc. And the disc is about 13 ounces. We're going to wrap it in a plastic wrap and put it in the fridge to chill for one to two hours. Just a little bit of flour on top. Roll away from your body. Lift it up and roll away. And then you're going to turn it. When you lift it up and turn it and roll away from your body, you're making sure that the crust doesn't stick to the countertop surface. Now we have to make the apples. So I have about six or seven apples that I've sliced, uh, cored, and peeled. We're going to put in cinnamon, ginger, and nutmeg granulated sugar, cat light brown sugar, uh, all purpose flour, and then I'm going to work that in with my fingers, or you can use a silicone spatula or a very large spoon. Then I'm going to add in some lemon juice. I'm going to take one tablespoon of butter, Put it into my saucepan and then I cook the apples until they are pork tender. So we have our pie shell that is lined with one disc of our crust. I'm going to take the apple pie filling and we're just going to simply put it into the pie shell. Now I've got my crust that I broke out earlier and I am just going to simply roll that on top of the pie crust. See how easy that was? Then we're going to take the edges and we're going to roll and tuck. Roll and tuck. And then I take my finger and I'm going to push like this. So push to crisp your pie crust. Then I'm going to take knife and I'm going to cut some bits on top of the pie crust. It's a very important step because your pie crust, because of the butter, is going to pop up and it needs space to uh, release the steam. So that's a very important step. But this is my favorite step that I love to do, which is the last step before I pop it into the oven. I have uh, one egg and then I'm going to have one tablespoon of water and then I do a egg wash. So once I've done the egg wash, I am going to place it on a baby sheet and put it in the center rack of the oven. Another tip is that I really don't want you to miss is to place it on a baby sheet so it can catch all of the juicy juices that may fall. I don't like to clean my oven, so I'd much rather clean a baby sheet than to clean my oven. So I have a beautifully glazed egg wash pie, and then when I take it out of the oven, Just I ate am. a whole apple pie before 10.54. Worth it, Maya. Worth every calorie <laughs> to get Maya's recipe. Head to today.com slash food. We'll be back right after this. Delicious.
peak apple season, mm. folks. So we're going to celebrate this morning with two delicious apple treats this Superfood Friday. Today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bauer is going to show us how to make apple fritters and also a fun spin on caramel apples. Joy, mm. always good to see you. Take it away. Hey guys, first let me say I love apples so much. They're crispy on the outside, juicy on the inside. Depending upon what variety you have, they bring all sorts of different flavor profiles, right? And they're loaded with nutrition. So we're going to start with a healthified version of apple fritters. And I'm holding an apple here. The first thing you do is you're going to core it right down the middle, okay. turn it sideways, and we're going to slice it into thin, I would say about an eighth of an inch pieces. They're circles. Let me show you what this looks like. Just like this. Oh, right. And so here I have a pancake batter. Oh. And so I'm using a whole grain, but you can use any kind that you have in the house. And Neither did I. <laughs> so I'm going to dip it right in. Oh, that's easy. Whoops. Right. And oh my goodness. Hold on a minute. I got to get another piece. Here we Joy go. Joy Bauer is just like us. I know. <laughs> Joy Bauer messes up. And so all you're going to do is put it right in a heated skillet okay. and you let them sit for about two minutes on each side. And you have two options here. You can either make, I'm going to show you, I have, I have a skillet right over here. Mm -hmm. You could make pancake like pieces. Mm -hmm. You could see the, the apple peeking through over here. Yeah, or good. if you want to poke the whole of the apple, you could make it more so like a little apple ring. And now, after they're all done, I'm going to bring you over to my island because I'm going to show you how to put the icing on the oh, cake, or I should icing. say the icing oh. on the fritter. Oh, yes. Does it cook yes. when you do it two minutes on each side? The apple still cooks enough? Yes, and this is what I would tell you, and that's a great point, Chanel. If you take a bite and you find that the apple is a little bit too firm, uh -huh. just lay them out on a plate and put it in the microwave for about 30 to 60 seconds because ideally what you want to get is this doughy goodness on the outside and a gushy, soft, oh, sweet apple on the inside. Yeah, and that's what they look like. Mm. So now I take a little bit of melted butter, oh. and all I'm going to do is spread it on the top and a little bit of sugar, or you can use oh sugar gosh. substitute if you want to pull back in a little bit of ground cinnamon. And that's it, guys. You make, it makes a great big bunch, and it's really delicious. Yeah. And so I hope everybody loves Joy, them. you also have your own take on, and I'm not surprised, caramel apples. You make a caramel sauce at home? <laughs> I am so excited about this recipe, and it's a caramel sauce you could feel really good about because I cleverly use dates. I'm taking dates, uh. which have natural sweetness. You put them into the blender. There's no corn syrup in this, and you don't need the stove either, which makes me very excited. So I add a cup of boiling water, and what that's going to do is soften up the dates. You let it sit for about 15 minutes. Again, it's going to make the dates much easier to blend. Then you remove about half a cup of water. It doesn't have to be an exact science, just some water. And I put in some maple syrup, a little bit, oops, a little bit of vanilla extract, mm -hmm. just about one teaspoon. And then this is really nice. If you could find it, this is just maple extract or maple flavor. You whirl this up. I'm just going to show you what this looks like. This is caramel sauce. This oh. is caramel sauce. And now we're making sheet pan caramel apples because we're going to take this over the top. So this is what it looks like when it's yeah. done. Beautiful. But so you take, you line your apple slices up, and then all you do is you put the caramel sauce over the top and all sorts of toppings, chocolate oh. chips, melty chocolate. Look, I have coconut in the middle. Oh. You could do walnuts, pecans. Joy. I mean, it's a party. It's amazing. It looks delightful. delightful. Oh, it's jinx. a party. Thank you, Joy. For the rest exactly. of these folks. Bye, guys. Have a great Bye. weekend. As always, it's today.com slash food. Alejandro Ramos is here with comfort foods mm. to warm us up as it gets cold. This mushroom kind of freaks me it's out It's kind of fun, bit. right? Yeah, I love it's a this. yummy yeah. one. It's a yummy mushroom. What's great about this is you can use any kind of mushroom. So you can use the classic button mushrooms mm -hmm. or go for something a little bit fancy, like an oyster or mm. shiitake. You can get the yeah. mix. Mix it up. Yeah, and so all you want to do is you kind of want to do a nice little rough chop on these, right? Doesn't mm -hmm. have to be anything They break down perfect. quite a bit when you cook they them. They break down a lot. So you're use, you're going to see all these mushrooms are going to go in there, okay. but that heat is going to pull out all of that water. Okay. Uh, also, when you're adding, you know, like a little bit of olive oil and salt, that pulls out all that water. So okay. You have in here. Here is just, we've got some carrots, some onions, and some celery, basically mm -hmm. the base of your dish. Then you add your mushrooms in, right? And I'm okay. going to cheat. I'm not going to do all of them right mm -hmm. now because it, 
It does need time to cook yes. down. And then once those mushrooms cook down a lot, then you add the garlic. You don't I think I've okay. overcooked yes. my garlic because well, I think I've been yeah. putting it in with it. Exactly. You don't want to do the garlic at the top because then it can burn and it yeah. can get bitter and then that flavor is going to be in yeah, the whole uh, the dish. And, okay. Right. And Chef, this is like very hearty, right? So it's good for fall? Yeah, it's a great fall dish. And what I love about it, it's like mushrooms are... They're meaty, right? So they're mm. really satisfying, and I love that they're just really filling. And you can add other things to it too. So if you've got leftover rotisserie chicken, or you want to add a little bit yeah. of Italian sausage to it, go ahead and do that. I love it vegetarian. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. And it's all in one pot. Once too, the veggies nice. are cooked, you add some flour. This is oh, going to help thicken it. I was wondering. It. Yeah. So that's what it is. That's going to thicken it. So okay. it's, uh, fill sure. in. If you want to give it like a little bit of a mix there. Okay. Right, so then flour. We're doing some chicken broth. Chicken broth. Ooh. And then you can do. This is optional, but you can do a little, um, like a little sherry Ooh. or. A little brandy. Oh, okay. It adds a nice flavor to it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is just going to great. It smells great. For, I mean, it already smells yeah. great, right? It, does, it yeah. smells like fall. It smells it like cozy okay. times. Uh, and then you're going to add some great herbs. Okay. So here we've got some chopped up rosemary, some mm -hmm. sage, some thyme, all those wonderful winter herbs. And then this is my little favorite trick. Mm. Is so this? this is nutmeg. Okay. A whole oh, nutmeg. Okay. You can buy the ground. I was ground. just buy it in the thing. I know. You can do I mean, yeah, totally go for it. it. And it lasts know. forever. It's fun. You, you it like grate it in. Okay. That goes right in. Okay. And it adds this wonderful little sort of touch of like subtle warmth to it. Oh, we got a minute left. We got yeah, okay, so it gets really nice and thick. And then you put your puff pastry right on top. Everything is in the can pot. Can we try this? Can we try this? Please try it in. Yeah. Talk to us about the dessert too, though. So the same same pastry? Exactly. So yeah. So then over here, now I've got a dessert version. So you can use either store but pie crust or puff pastry. Okay. And this is an apple pie empanada. Oh mm. I grew up eating empanadas for everything. We basically just put everything in dough. Yeah. Uh, right? You, Tom, <laughs> no, no, you no I was going to say, <laughs> and this dish is like, think of a, of a McDonald's apple pie, but yes, way yep. better. Exactly. Very similar. Very yeah, similar. Exactly. Oh so there you go. It's okay. like a little, it's the a McDonald's apple pie with a Latin twist. To another next level. Level. Doesn't it, just, it just totally elevates oh my those goodness. flavors. <laughs> Do not go food shopping until you see this next yeah, dessert. Because our pal Dono Skian has a beautiful apple crumble cake that your family will devour. We can't wait to see this dessert you're going to cook up for us. So what are we going to make? We're going to make an Irish apple crumble cake. The book is filled with family classics, and there's a whole dessert baking section in there that celebrates the sort of things we want to cook around this time of the year. So we're going to make up this Irish apple crumble cake. And the first thing you got to do is soften down your apples. So I'm going to take some uh, peeled, cored, and diced apples. Pop in a little bit of water. There's a hot pan over here. Um, a little bit of water. They're going to stew out. And we're going to literally... Oh, that's a very hot pan over there. <laughs> we're going to stew them out with a little bit of sugar. And basically cook them out until they're really nice and softened down. And what you should be left with is something that looks like this. It's still holding its shape a little bit, but it's gone sweet, soft, and mushy, and gorgeous Donald, things are happening in Donald, here. Is there, yeah. I mean, I know there are a million kinds yes. of apples out there. What, what do you apples like? should we use to bake? I always get nervous when I say this in America, but do you know what a Granny Smith is over there? Yes, we, we love do. Granny! <laughs> Go with the Granny Smith. It's going to okay. be gorgeous in here. Okay. It's crisp, it's tart, but it's still got a bit of sweetness, and it's going to be lovely in this batter. Now, for our batter, I have creamed together some butter and some sugar. I've added my eggs. I've added a little bit of flour in there as well. And we're going to get that stewed apple in 
alongside oh, a oh, little bit of flour. And now, of course, it's fall. We're thinking of Thanksgiving around the corner. You've got to go with a little bit of cinnamon spice in there. So spice. go as heavy as you fancy here. It's really something that works well with apples. Okay. And for a little bit of rise, we're going in there with our baking powder. We've got a little bit of flour as well. And basically, you're going to bring that batter together. It's quite a dense but sweet mixture. Yeah. And it really is a foolproof recipe. Like a lot of the recipes in the book, this is about getting results and making sure that if you go to the trouble of cooking, you're gonna get a seriously gorgeous result. So with this cake batter, once you've mixed that through, the moisture of the apple is gonna get in there, the cinnamons, mm -hmm. all those great mm. things are gonna happen. You're gonna pop that into two spring form cake pans, uh, cake, cake tins with a little bit of parchment paper. Mm -hmm. It's gonna bake off for about three, uh, at 325 degrees Fahrenheit for about 40 minutes wow. until the skewer is clear. Uh, and beautiful. then you're going to have the four ingredients that bring together this cake. So I have my cake that uh, is slightly iced. For our icing, um, you make up a very simple batter. Um, oh, it's just a buttercream frosting. I pop that on top. But the finishing touches of this are the crumble that we're going to create. So wow. I've, put, I've, pre I've just, with my fingertips, pushed together some flour and some butter. To this, we're going to add some chopped hazelnuts yeah. and then a nice bit of sweetness in the form of some brown sugar. So get that in there, Love get that mixed through, sugar. and this is going to go into the oven as well. So you get this gorgeous sweet crumble mm. mixture that's going to go beautiful over the top of that. So that's our topping into the oven, get that baked off, and you should have something that's crisp Can and crunchy see? and gorgeous oh, to taste over the you top. You bake that you stuff. You bake it. Ah, okay, got it, got yes. it. Yes. Yes, and it's sweet and it's crisp and it's crunch and it adds that, you know, because you've got a dense sweet thing going on over here. You're yeah. talking about textures and flavors. And the other thing we're going to do is slice what up is some more Granny Smith, soften it down with some butter and some sugar and a little bit of water. And then you get these beautiful little strands that are going to be part of our decoration on top. Oh, but cool. when you have your buttercream frosting, yeah. the trick here and what gives a beautiful sweetness is dulce de leche stirred oh. fruit. Are you with me, ladies? Dolce are you with leche. me? I love that. So what do you do to so, make that okay, dulce de leche? Look at that buy it. Don't don't make it. Don't even worry about it. Go Just and bake. Go it. and buy it in the Just store. This it. is Thanksgiving. You're up to your ears it already doing things. Tired. You don't want to be making those in that day. It's an easy one, but you know, at the same time, let's take the shortcuts that we need around this time of year. So we're gonna finish the cake with our frosting that's spread over the top. Mm. Those lovely little apple strands, they're gonna mm. place in and around here. So you get a bite of sweet apple in every single slice. And then we're gonna top it off with our finishing layer over oh, the top. Show us. So, Look at Place that. that on top, oh. and then literally you build, you build, you build until you have something that looks as phenomenal as this. Now, can you imagine your oh Thanksgiving God. table no. landing no, we can't. that Don't straight know. We the really deck. can't. That is beautiful. <laughs>
It was very evident that there were racial disparities uh, in dental school. You could just sit in class and tell that the number of dental school students who were um, students of color was very, very slim to none. And we just kind of banded together. We made a pact with each other that we would get through school. Um, and that's exactly what we did. We all accomplished the goal of being dentists. She is now working to inspire the next generation of dentists with Beyond Her Smile, an organization that exposes young black girls to dentistry. Hi. Good morning, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm just gonna put this on you. Okay. Beyond Her Smile really is truly focusing on a segment of girls who need that exposure because I think exposure is key. The earlier we start exposing them to the dental field and other STEM fields, the better. Does anybody know how many teeth an adult has? 26? Oh no, 36. No. Is 32? it close to that? 32. They get hands-on experience with patients and learn the ins and outs of running a dental practice. You'll see them interacting with the patients, walking the patients back. They'll be talking, chatting with the patients. And then after that, we sit down and chat with the girls and let them know that they can, they can do anything that they put their mind to. They can be a dentist if that's what they choose to do. Like 13-year-old Cameron Wallace, who hopes to pursue a career in STEM. I know a group is going to be able to help me reach my full potential and something that I really look forward to and 12-year-old Micah Ingram, whose interest in dentistry began after her own journey with braces. You actually got to see the process and like real life working on their teeth and talking with the patients. Dr. Jarrett hopes the program will expand to reach even more young girls in the coming years. I'm here to serve and I think my best way of serving is to reach young minority girls because I was once in their shoes. So it's so rewarding and fulfilling to me to see them come in, gain the knowledge, gain the experience, telling their parents that they love the experience, that they know for sure this is something that they want to do in life. Her advice to the next generation of dentists, to never give up. Go for it. I say it is attainable. It is achievable. The sky is the limit for any little girl of color who looks like me, who dreams like I dreamt. As long as they have the passion, the determination, the faith, and the drive, they can be a dentist. Now to an inspiring conversation with the CEO and breast cancer survivor who's defied all the odds and made it her mission to change the way the world looks at black women and breast cancer. I try to like let everything go and just paddle and just feel the water and see the feel the sun or the wind, feel God around me. Ricky Fairley starts most of her days like this, alone and at peace on the Chesapeake Bay. But this mother of two didn't always know how to slow down. Like most caregivers, Ricky was constantly on the go. I was a crazy, busy, typical mom working mom. I actually had been married for 30 years and um, I was the breadwinner for our family, traveling every week on the road. After a routine mammogram, the words triple negative breast cancer stopped her in her tracks. My doctor said, we found five spots on your chest wall. You are now metastatic. You have two years to live, get your affairs in order. We don't have anything for you. And I said, well, I can't really die right now. I have a daughter at Dartmouth, I have to pay for her tuition. So me, you and God and some drugs or something, we gotta work this out. It was a long road of surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation and experimental drugs, but it worked and Ricky was cancer free. She decided to quit her old life and start fresh. I knew I had to get rid of all the cancers in my life. I divorced my husband of 30 years. I quit my business partner of 10 years. I sold my house in Alpharetta, Georgia with a pool and two acres and I moved to my little one bedroom condo on the beach. She also did a lot of research and learned about the disparity in breast cancer for black women. This disease for black women is a different disease. And now we have a growing body of data that validates that a black breast cancer cell looks different from a white one. We have a 41% higher mortality rate than white women. We have a 39% higher recurrence rate 
of breast cancer than white women, which is crazy. So with her new home, her new fiance, and her new way of life came a new purpose, a nonprofit called Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance. I wanted to change the game on how the world thinks about black women and breast cancer. I want to advance the science. I want to stop the dying. I wanted to bring pharmaceutical companies to the table to say, deal with this, help us. 11 years after she was told she was going to die, Ricky is still cancer free and has been able to watch her oldest daughter get married and have a family of her own. I work for my granddaughters. I don't want them to ever think about this disease. I don't want them to have to talk about it. I don't want, them to, I don't want it to be in their existence. As for her younger daughter, Haley, Ricky got her wish and watched her graduate college. They now work side by side to help other women going through the unthinkable. Seeing my mom firsthand being sick and dealing with all the things that come with it, and now just the things that even come with survivorship, just being a support system for these women has been a large part of my mission. And so what I'm trying to do now for the breast cancer community is also create that safe space. Looking back, Ricky has advice for her younger, busier self. Your peace is non-negotiable. Take care of yourself. Check your breasts. Give yourself a minute. Give yourself a pause. It's okay to say no. And as she sits with her family, four generations of strong women, Ricky's mission is clear. I'm a miracle. I know I'm a miracle. I shouldn't be here. So many women that, with, that had what I had didn't make it. And I know that God left me here to do this work, to be an advocate for other women. It's my purpose. <sighs> Ricky, I mean, we are in awe of you. Your purpose came with that horrible diagnosis. Yes. A huge change. You made so many changes that you're probably too afraid to make your whole life. What, what was there ever a point of trepidation? Should I divorce my husband, change all these things because of this of what happened to you? No, there was no trepidation. I knew, I knew in my spirit that I had to save my life. And um, I just went for it. I didn't even think twice about it. And people said, are you crazy? Are you sure you should do all this at one time? Do you want to think about it? I said, no, I have to go now. You know, the best thing about this is that you had the second life and you're using it mm -hmm. to help other women. Mm -hmm. you, those statistics mm -hmm. that we heard in the piece are unacceptable. Yeah, are. You could have just read those and thought, okay, but instead you're fighting yeah. them. And that just seems like uh -huh. an incredible mission. Mm -hmm. I work for my granddaughters. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to ever think about breast cancer. And we have a lot of work to do to save black women. And I don't, I don't want anybody to die of breast cancer, but we deserve mortality rate parity. Well, I thought what you said after the diagnosis was like, you, the doctor, me, God, medicine, whatever. <laughs> so we all, we're all going to have to work together <laughs> right, on this right. one. You sound like your faith was unshakable throughout. It was. I, you know, faith is my spiritual gift. Yeah. I know that God left me here to do this work, mm -hmm. and um, I'm on a mission to try to change how we think about it. Well, Ricky, um, yeah. we are impressed with you, if that's not obvious, but also Thrive Cosmetics. Mm -hmm. They told us they were so inspired by the work that you do to eradicate black breast cancer that yeah. guess what? They're donating $10,000 wow. to touch. Oh, yeah. wow. to continue the efforts wow. that you put in and oh, everything wow, you do. that's so awesome. Will that be able to make a difference? That will be awesome. You know, we have this movement called When We Trial. Mm -hmm. When we trial.org to educate black women about clinical trials yes. so we can get better drugs. So I will put it to work oh, today. Awesome. You're unbelievable. Ricky, we love you. You're unbelievable. <laughs> wow, what a thank gift you, for us. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's oh. such a blessing. Wow. Thank you thank so much. Too. When we come back, we'll meet a sheriff making history in her state right after this.
We're back on the boost with another inspiring story. This one's about a woman in Minnesota who made history when she became the state's very first black female sheriff. Check it out. Inside the Hennepin County Jail, Nate Johnson's Free Riders class has a special guest. This isn't the end of the line for you. Sheriff Dewana Witt. A few weeks on the job, it's not unusual to see her here, but what might surprise you is what she says. I was that person who was afraid of the police, saw my brother's butt get kicked many times by the police. It's why she says she never expected to find herself in a uniform. What led you to law enforcement? You know, I used to tell people it was an accident. I do tell people this is my purpose. Cindy? If there is a conventional path to law enforcement, Sheriff Witt is far from it. Growing up in South Minneapolis with her four siblings, drugs and violence were always nearby. By age 15, Dewana was a mother. I saw myself as a statistic. As a teenage mother? As a teenage mother, as someone growing up in poverty. My mother had a drug addiction. My father was an alcoholic. And with that environment came a very early mistrust of police. A man was shot. He was shot by the police, actually. And I could have been all of four or five years old. But 24 years ago, something changed when Sheriff Witt, then working for a nonprofit, happened to take a tour of the jail. At the end of that tour, they talked about how they needed women in the field and women of color. She applied on a whim and got hired as a detention deputy. That's when her views started to shift. I started having more encounters with law enforcement, men and women, and getting to know them as individuals. You know, my barriers that I had, they were falling. Over the next two decades, she worked her way up through the ranks. Then, in January, according to the law and the best of my ability, Sheriff Dewana Witt became the first woman to lead her department and the first black female sheriff in the state of Minnesota. A milestone that's all the more meaningful when you consider where she is. Black Hennepin County, the very county where George Floyd was killed. The street where he died was just a block away from the community center where Sheriff Witt grew up. You watched that video along with the rest of the world. Yes. The big difference, of course, is that you were watching it happen in your own community. That was probably one of the most difficult times of my entire life. It ruined a lot of things that had been done to make this profession better and to bridge the gap within communities. She says the hits came from all sides. People would look at me as a black woman, as a black person in a uniform, like, what are you doing? You know, being called names from traitors to Auntie Tammy instead of Uncle Tom. These were fellow black people that yeah, would look yeah. at you and wonder why you were in law enforcement. Yeah, it's like, you know, you're on the wrong side. Mm. And that's, I'm sorry, I can never say, talk about this without getting a little choked up. Yeah. But if people would have just known the story of like what it takes to do this job as a black person and to have people say those things to you, it was, it was hurtful. Despite it all, she says she never thought about leaving the job. I knew that I needed to be a person who could interpret, if you will, what people were seeing, because everybody couldn't understand that. For Sheriff Witt, then a major, that meant talking to people, protesters, face to face, even when other officers warned her not to, a step toward building trust. That we had a sense of safety and security. Last November, one of her very first visits after winning the election was the jail. And as she walked among the inmates, Sheriff Witt got a big surprise. People were standing up and applauding me. When you walked in. And they're in. like, that's our sheriff, y'all. You know, I realized that I'm a symbol of hope for some people and uh, hope for change. So I got a lot to live up to, but I'm, I'm ready for it. Coming up, how one woman used nature to help her own healing and why thousands are on board with the idea. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to The Boost. We love to celebrate women who are making positive impacts in their communities. A woman started a Facebook group to get others into nature, but she never imagined how her small idea would change lives in a big way. If you are on the water and you can really immerse yourself and it feels like as if you're this little ant on this big body of water, it feels very liberating. Tanya Walker knows the joys of kayaking and she's made it her purpose to share it. All the first time kayakers! Woo! As the founder of Black Women Who Kayak in Austin, Texas, Tanya hosts events for women to connect with one another and with nature. I have never before kayaked in my life until this group. It's Tanya's way of giving back to a community that's given her so much after a divorce in 2005 left her and her two young sons without a home. She turned to the Austin Shelter for Women and Children. When I was in the lowest point of my life, my community helped me and my boys. So it's important for me to give back to my community. As she got back on her feet, she found spending time outdoors to be healing. So in 2018, she decided to share that experience with others. For African-American culture, one of the things is we don't do certain things. It's not the fact that we don't do certain things, but it's why we don't do these things. The barriers of not feeling welcome or when it comes to water is not knowing how to swim or being afraid of big bodies of water. Tanya tackled these barriers head on. She partnered with local businesses to offer swimming lessons and hosted outdoor activities like hiking and canyoneering to spark interest in nature. I took advantage of the opportunity to take some swimming lessons before I actually had my first kayaking event. And then once I was on the water, I just immediately fell in love with it. The spaces that you don't see us or you rarely see us, those are the areas that I want to address and I want to make sure that, you know, those spaces are welcoming. The group has grown to more than 2,000 members across eight chapters in the U.S. And now the group does more than just kayak. She recently changed the name to Black Women Who. It could be scary at times doing something that you've never done before, but the cool thing is is that you're not doing it alone. You're doing it with somebody else who looks like you, but are also probably doing it the first time as well. To get the word out, Tanya wrote about the group for Soul City magazine. It was a move that proved life-changing for Heath Creech, the magazine's publisher. In our first or second conversation, I mentioned kind of casually that um, I was on dialysis because I have kidney failure. And she said, ever since I was a little girl, I've always wanted to donate an organ. Wait, what? When he told me what he was on dialysis, that conversation just got fueled and then it started, I just started thinking about, hey, I could, I could help and, and be a, a kidney donor for him. She went through the testing process and they were a match. Heath and Tanya underwent surgery in January 2023, just six months after meeting for the first time. The operation was a success. This is definitely a lifelong connection. Tanya, she is just a natural born, giving, kind hearted, loving kind of person. Six weeks post op, Tanya is back on the water for the first time at the Texas Rowing Center, leading the largest group of women she's hosted on the Colorado River. So, is this your first time kayaking? Awesome. I love what Tanya has put together. It gives me the ability to connect with other black women and be outdoors. I was able to turn my passion, which is kayaking, into my purpose to take other women on the water to have that same feeling that I get. That's been the most empowering part of this whole journey. This next artist had commissions all over the world. Inspired by a mix of art history and pop culture, her work highlights and elevates black women and their beauty. The result, stunning paintings and portraits that speak for themselves. Hi, I'm Micheline Thomas. This is my studio, welcome. This Brooklyn art space is a far cry from the law firm where artist Micheline Thomas always envisioned herself. It was an exhibition by artist and photographer Carrie Mae Weems that set Micheline on an entirely different path. It changed my life. It was so familiar and so resonant of who I was as a young girl, a young woman, and an African-American woman. It was like, okay, this is the power of art. To see yourself in images 
And so that gave me inspiration to want to become an artist. She started working with simple, inexpensive materials. You have to sometimes work within your means. And oil paint wasn't always something I could afford. And so what I could afford were the lesser materials, which were mostly the craft materials. It was th that experimentation led to how I'm making my work today. Her unique collages of rhinestones and enamel made a big impact. These days, her innovative and distinctive work can be seen in galleries and museums across the globe. During art school, I was really disappointed in the art history. When you look at these sort of iconic images, the black body was always in servitude positions. And it was just like, that's not how I see myself. I saw a void within art history, and I decided to insert myself. Her first muse, her mother. Really wanting to bring forth a particular beauty of a woman of a certain age. They're overlooked, and their beauty is not considered as valuable anymore. So it was really great for me to really start with my mother when she was in her 50s. She has continued to place black women at the center of her art, including the former first lady, Mrs. Michelle Obama, and a work that now hangs in the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. Micheline Thomas is one of the most influential artists, I think, working today. Her use of materials, her aesthetic is widely recognizable. Her work is very much about commanding space, but also taking up space. Now at 52 years old, Micheline is the age her mother was when she first started photographing her. I think it's a great power as a woman to look at other women and celebrate them, to celebrate us. I think there's a great beauty and inspiration in acknowledging ourselves. So young girls who look like me and who were me can see themselves in the image to give them a sense of validation. Micheline recently returned from Paris Fashion Week, where she designed the backdrop for the Dior Haute Couture show. For so long, the black female body has been on the peripheral, not as the primary sort of focus when it comes to beauty. And so for Dior to embrace that, to integrate that into the fold and concept with my work, these are the type of collaborations of the future. In a full circle moment, her inspiration, artist Carrie Mae Weems has become her subject. It's important for all Americans to see African Americans in a position of their humanity in these institutions. It is an American story. It is the complexity of the American story that is absolutely beautiful and riveting and important to be shared. I think as a creative person, it's such a gift to have the opportunity to see things in the world, respond to it, inspire it, take it in, and see what it means to you and how you can impact the world. Stick around for another uplifting story right after the break. with one last fun video for you. Check it out. More proof this morning that age is truly just a number. Take a look.
Dan. Hey, wow. 73. All right, for the last year, he's been a regular at beginning and intermediate classes at this dance studio in Vegas. The teacher says, Dan, one of his favorite students because his energy and his commitment. I love it. He's having a good time. Thank you so much for joining us for another fun day here on The Boost. We'll be back here tomorrow with more feel-good stories. See you next time right here on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. It's like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Anal stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. Hi, I'm Keir Simmons, and welcome to the Royal Rundown. It's been one year since Queen Elizabeth passed away after more than 70 years on the throne. But there will be no official public events in the UK to commemorate her passing. In fact, King Charles plans to spend the day not here at Buckingham Palace, but, quote, quietly and privately in Scotland. The last 12 months for the King have been anything but quiet. Nearly everything changed from the life he knew just 12 months ago. Over the next half hour, we'll explore those changes. Plus, what's to come for the rest of the royal family? William and Kate, how will they evolve the future monarchy? And what can we hope to see from other members moving forward? We'll answer all that, but first, let's recap the last year and give you a royal rundown of where the monarchy was and is today. Take a look. This morning, marking a year since her passing, the palace releasing this picture of Queen Elizabeth aged 42, chosen by her son and heir. King Charles and Queen Camilla attending a private memorial in Scotland, while the Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, heading to a separate service in Wales. Prince Harry in town for a charity event last night. I know exactly one year on that she is looking down on all of us tonight. Overnight, King Charles releasing an audio message to mark his mother's passing one year ago. We recall with great affection her long life, devoted service, and all she meant to so many of us. The Queen's passing was a moment in history, the closing of a 70-year-long royal chapter. Her dedication to duty evident to the end. During her final days, she appointed a new prime minister, her family, her nation, and the world knew this day would come, but many seemed unprepared. I think in many ways, the announcement of the Queen's death 12 months ago was a deep shock to most Brits, even though she was in her mid-90s, even though we knew that she'd uh, had failing health because of what it stood for, because of how it made us all feel about our place in the world and how she had been this continuity for most of our lifetimes. God save the King. Since that day, it's been quite a year. Prince Charles became King Charles. His son and their wives reunited briefly. Then the funeral, full of the pomp and ceremony of days past, attended by world leaders and ordinary people whose lives she touched, though it seemed like everyone had their own special memory. The King's new role brought many unfamiliar moments, each one poignant as the last with the Queen missing. This his first state banquet as monarch, and it has brought new responsibilities for other royals, most notably William and Kate, now Prince and Princess of Wales. I think we've definitely seen William and Kate stepping into the limelight, taking centre stage, sharing the stage, of course, with Camilla and with Charles, but certainly being very, very pivotal. They travelled to the US to award their Earthshot Prize, a successful trip, but overshadowed by one of King Charles' first crises, new allegations of racism in Buckingham Palace, vehemently denied by the royal family. And as the royals prepared for Christmas, Harry and Meghan 
delivered an unwelcome gift. They're happy to lie to protect my brother. Their Netflix show making headlines, causing more controversy for the new King Charles. I said we need to get out of here. Who's next? And in the new year, another scandal. The publication of Prince Harry's book, Spare, with private details of royal life and even an allegation of a physical altercation with his brother. The King's sons, far from united under his reign. Thankfully for Charles, the coronation was staged without a hitch. God save the King! God save the King! Harry attending, though without Meghan, and Camilla for the first time referred to as Queen rather than Queen Consort. The balcony moment framing a new, scaled down royal family, with the younger generation, William and Kate's children, George, Charlotte, and Louis, very much in the spotlight. Prince Andrew unequivocally on the outside after scandals that have not disappeared. For King Charles, it has been a far from easy year, but then stepping into his mother's role, who made everything seem so easy, was never going to be without challenges. Her legacy of hard work, duty, and quiet continuity seems alive in her air, though there will never be a monarch quite like her again. My goodness, so much has changed with this family and with the family business. And there's no one better to help us break it down than royal commentator Daisy McAndrew. Hey, Daisy. How are you? So uh, King Charles will uh, this year mark his mother's passing privately. Do you think that's a tradition he's going to continue? Yes, I think all the signs are pointing in that direction. We know that the Queen used to do the same thing. On February the 6th, the anniversary of her father's death, she would be in Sandringham where he had died on that day, quietly thinking about him, uh, collecting her thoughts, a private day away from the scrutiny of the public. And that's certainly what we think Charles will continue to do after this year. Go to the place, uh, Balmoral in this instance, where his mother died um, and have no public engagements, be there with his wife Camilla thinking about the past year and thinking about the Queen. It's been a roller coaster year for the King in so many ways. What are the key moments, uh, the key changes, if you like, this past 12 months that you would pick out? Well, of course, I think once the dust had settled from the coronation, which was the big event formally marking uh, his accession to the throne, after that, it was really all eyes on Charles to see what he might change and what he might uh, keep the same as before. And I think some people have been surprised that it's been more of a continuity reign um, than any dramatic changes. And certainly those around him are saying that's what he wanted. He didn't want to frighten the horses in some ways, but start the hard work of changing things from the inside out. Some people slightly disappointed that there haven't been uh, more shake-ups. For instance, um, a lot of people expected by now we would have heard that some of the buildings, like Buckingham Palace, might have become uh, more open to the public. Yeah. So far, little action on that. Yeah, scaled down royal family. Where's that right now, right? And on that issue, the scaled down royal family, of course, we have seen some moves behind the scenes to try to cut things down, slim down uh, the scale and the expense, namely trying to evict his brother, Andrew, from yeah. Royal Lodge in Windsor. Um, other things, though, I think we've seen him embrace some of the issues that he wants to be known for. We've got a big project coming forward uh, where he's trying to affect food waste, reducing food waste. And that's one of those issues, it's not party political, so it's not controversial, but it's clearly something that aligns with the King's own morals and, and things he feels passionately about. Do you think the public here are warming to him? I do. There have been a couple of polls in the last few weeks. There's been an Ipsos Mori one, there's been a YouGov one, um, asking people how, if at all, their opinion has changed uh, of the royals and of Charles in particular in the last year. And both of those polls have been quite positive. They have shown an uptick in popularity. As ever, it's the younger demographic that he's got an issue with, and yeah. I think we'll see more in the coming months and years trying to appeal to those people. What about the younger royals, the box office members of the royal family, if you like, William and Kate and their children? How have they been doing in the past year and what do you think we're going to see from them? We've seen more of them, which is exactly what we expected all along. Of course, William now being you know, the, the heir to the throne, being uh, the Prince of Wales and Catherine being the Princess of Wales. And we have seen them really take centre stage. You and I have talked a lot over the past couple of years um, expecting that to happen, that it would be a foursome really of Kate, William, Camilla, Charles, who would be at the helm of this family. And I think that's exactly what we've seen. Thank you. 
Daisy, and after the break, the Prince and Princess of Wales, right in the centre of the spotlight, as we were just talking about. What responsibilities have they taken over from King Charles, and what we will see now of their littlest, the members of the royal family? That's all coming up. Welcome back to the Royal Rundown. Queen Elizabeth's death established Prince William as the heir apparent to the British throne. He's already taken on this new role with ease, but there will be more duties in the years ahead for him, his wife and their children. NBC's Kelly Kobiea has more. Take a look. After the Queen's passing last year, the line of succession shifted for the monarchy, bringing new responsibilities for members of the royal family and new titles for William and Kate, the Prince and Princess of Wales. With the world watching, the Prince and Princess have stepped into their new roles. Our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations. The two holding multiple titles, which is quite typical for the royal family, also known as the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and Cambridge. William takes over as the Duke of Cornwall from his father, traditionally held by the eldest son of the reigning British monarch, inheriting the Duchy of Cornwall, an estate that includes more than 130,000 acres of land worth over a billion dollars. While William and Kate have always been among the most beloved royals, their actions now carry more significance than ever. It's said that the Queen brought her son Charles into the fold on official matters, a blueprint he'll likely replicate to prepare William for his eventual reign. I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set. Royal watchers expect King Charles will rely heavily on his eldest son as both an advisor and an extension of the crown. As their royal roles evolve, the Prince and Princess of Wales will continue to champion causes close to them, like the environment. It's my hope the Earthshot legacy will continue to grow, helping our communities and our planet to thrive. Mental health. Catherine Harrow launched this campaign uh, last year, and extremely proud. Ending homelessness with the launch of Homewards and early childhood development. Does it make you feel better when you talk about your feelings? Yeah. As seen in the launch of Princess Kate's campaign, Shaping Us, earlier this year. And although Prince William won't receive any formal training to one day be king, it's a job he's been preparing for his whole life. His lessons in kingship started by his grandmother's knee, and he has had in both his grandmother and his father great mentors. William, Kate, and their family represent a new chapter in the monarchy. You look at Kate and William, a young, working couple with a young family juggling the school run with their interests, with Kate and her early learning, with William and his environmental awards. You can see that they are meant to be not dissimilar to us. Therefore, we should and could and hopefully will feel a connection to them. This shift brings about change for William and Kate's children as well. 
Prince George, now second in line for the throne, followed by his sister, Princess Charlotte, and brother, Prince Louis. We've seen much more of the children than usual over the last year, from the coronation to Wimbledon. They are the future. Kate will one day be a big part of a future coronation, as will George. And I think any reminders to the British public, this is the future. The future of the royal family is in safe and popular hands. That's very valuable. All eyes will be on the Prince and Princess of Wales as they continue to settle into their new roles, marking the beginning of a new era for the royal family. The Prince and Princess of Wales are, are not the only ones at work. With the Duke and Duchess of Sussex stepping down as senior royal members and the Queen's passing, there have been more family members representing the Crown at events and charitable organisations. Take a look. As the royal family and the British nation adjusted to life without Queen Elizabeth II... The ability to have somebody who is kind of epitomises what you think your country stands for has always been a major ambition. A group of royals moved closer to centre stage, most notably the King's siblings, Princess Anne and Prince Edward, who were named councillors of the state by King Charles, giving them the power to stand in the King's place in the event that he is unwell or unable to fulfil a particular duty. Princess Anne was the first to return to royal duties at the start of 2023, one of her first trips of the year to Cyprus, meeting with British peacekeepers and paying tribute to Commonwealth soldiers who died at war. The Princess Royal had a very busy spring, traveling to New Zealand, where she met the first responders in the wake of a cyclone that hit the country, visiting the Wellington barracks to meet and thank officers participating in King Charles's coronation, and paying tribute to veterans at the National Memorial Arboretum. But one of Princess Anne's most memorable moments was, of course, receiving a special role in the coronation of King Charles III. She served as gold stick in waiting, a role similar to a bodyguard, and led the grand royal procession from Westminster Abbey to Buckingham Palace. Anne's brother, Prince Edward, started the year with a major moment, inheriting his late father's title of Duke of Edinburgh on his 59th birthday, while his wife, Sophie, became Duchess. Thank you very much indeed for uh, welcoming us to, uh, to Edinburgh today on indeed a very special and, uh, and, and for a slightly overwhelming day for, for now my wife and Duchess. <laughs> The Duke and Duchess attended their first event with their new titles, meeting with members of the Ukrainian community at Edinburgh's city chambers to mark one year since the city's formal response to the invasion of Ukraine. He also became patron of the Duke of Edinburgh Award in his father's place and hosted a meeting with 10 award participants. And there will be future generations of people turning up here for the awards thinking that I was responsible for this, but it's not true. It was indeed my father and visited the May Murray Foundation in Ireland, helping people of all ages and abilities participate in water activities. You're going in, and just, just for a swim, or do you like going on the surfboard? I'm going on the surfboard. You're going on the surfboard. Prince Edward's wife, Sophie, has followed in the footsteps of her late father-in-law, Prince Philip, by choosing agriculture and farm life as one focus area of her official work. Earlier this year, she was named president of the Driffield Agricultural Society and even became the first UK royal ever to visit Baghdad in an effort to support women and gender equality around the world. Though left with huge shoes to fill, it seems those royals, once waiting in the wings, are stepping into the spotlight. Only time will tell if this trend continues or King Charles has something else up his sleeve for the future. Coming up, we switch gears to the Invictus Games. Prince Harry's beloved charitable event kicks off tomorrow in Germany. Stay with us.
Welcome back. While Prince Harry has stepped away from his royal duties, his charitable efforts are still in full swing. Supporting wounded veterans is still very close to his heart. In fact, the Invictus Games kicks off this weekend in Germany. Last year, he invited our very own Hoda Kotb to the Games in the Netherlands and gave her a behind-the-scenes look at what the event is all about. Take a look. Stop it. Wait, the gang's all here? Come here. I need to see y'all. The wiggly does. <laughs> Both Prince Harry and the Rodriguez family know just how important a support system is. Let's go! Don't stop it! And this is the pep squad for Joel Rodriguez, a U.S. Army retired staff sergeant. Yes! Yes! Is it fun watching your dad? Yes. <gasps> He's super fast. Yes. How fast is he? Like, he could go 30 miles per hour. Wow. Whoa! To son Elijah, 10-month-old daughter Layla, and his wife Liani, Joel is a superhero. What is he teaching your kids? He definitely is teaching them to get up every day, to work hard, to go after everything that you want, right? And um, stick to it no matter what happens, wins, losses, whatever, just keep going in life. Prior to 2014, Joel was a passionate Army sergeant, but a devastating car accident not only derailed Joel's Army career, but left him with a fractured neck and a severe spinal cord injury. A lot of people would have thought these are the cards I'm dealt. This is what I get, and I have to live with this. And maybe, maybe I've taken it kind of slowly through life. You did the total opposite, man. You went all the way in. You said cards, and that's funny because when my wife came to see me in um, probably a day after my surgery, she was like, are you okay? I said, well, these are the cards I have, so I have to play them. <laughs> and I said, so I'm just going to do what I can to be the best person I can in this situation. And I mean, it's, I'm still doing it. That's, that's all we can do. What does it mean to watch uh, these guys and women just shine like this? As far as I'm concerned, they've shone throughout their careers anyway, right? You know, to be able to see Joel and his family just flourish in moments like this, it means everything. But really it comes back to the very simple thing, which is this, the power of sport. Mm. You know, not just physical, but the, the mental rehabilitation that it takes is, is phenomenal. And Joel is in good company, surrounded by 500 competitors from 19 nations, where camaraderie and resilience are celebrated at the Invictus Games, like retired military petty officer Jacob Cox. Awesome. <laughs> I want you to have yeah. those. Wait, these really are for me? Yes, those are for you. Just, just because? Just because. <laughs> I want you to have them. Is that okay? That was really nice. Thank you. Oh my God, that was so sweet. For Jacob, who is visually impaired, the 100 meter is an incredible feat. I'm legally blind, so I run with a blindfold and a guide. Yeah, so. Holy moly. So my guide has to put in all the work <laughs> because he has to run his races and run them again for me. And retired Air Force Tech Sergeant Gonzalez, who suffered a head injury during a training exercise while on active duty. Retired in 2016 from the Air Force, um, severe PTSD, TBI, and other um, neurological ailments, and uh, wasn't able to function, I wasn't able to do my job, and, you know, I could no longer serve, so, like, my whole world was over, my heart was broken, and I was suicidal, and then I saw uh, a video of the Invictus Games, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> I need to do what I can to find how to get involved. I competed in eight individual events, and I not only won, I won by 11 points. <laughs> and then a month later, they said, you got a spot on Team U.S. Okay, so. I can't. I can't. <laughs> For these athletes, the Invictus Games has played a part in their recovery, showing resilience goes beyond the battlefield. When we come back, Harry Smith looks back at the extraordinary life of Queen Elizabeth, woven through nearly a century of world history.
Welcome back. On February the 6th, 1952, 25-year-old Princess Elizabeth was traveling with her husband Philip in Kenya when she got a phone call with the news that her father, King George VI, had died and she would be the Queen of England. She held that title for over 70 years. We end the show with a look back at the Queen on the front row of a century of history. Here's Harry Smith. I now before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. When Elizabeth took the throne in 1953, her country didn't have enough food to feed itself. Yes, still recovering from World War II, Britain would not suspend food rationing for another year. Yet there she was, in a first, a worldwide telecast. Hers was a realm that was hungry for a monarch who might lead it into the modern world, a sovereign who could put shine back on the remnants of an empire that had sacrificed all it could. Her Majesty would do all that and more, of course. She was a queen who would be both regal on the throne and reliable as a rudder in stormy seas, both personal and political. We asked around the office, can you name another queen besides Queen Latifah and Aretha Franklin? Nobody. Thanks to shows like The Crown, we think we got a glance into royal responsibilities. There's a delicate matter which I felt I needed to discuss with you in person. Concerning what? Your position. Those meetings with the prime ministers? Wow. She saw them all. Fifteen of them, starting with Winston Churchill. And just days ago, Liz Truss. Look at her scrapbook of presidents. Harry Truman when she was a princess. Riding horses with Ronald Reagan. Talk about a photo op. Elizabeth was a presence, both familiar and utterly unknowable. Gossip about the royal family is an industry in the UK. Here in the US, we hire royal watchers to help us divine the mysteries of Buckingham Palace and Balmoral Castle. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, wrote Shakespeare. Hers was a life both enviable and unescapable, human, not divine. Our favorite images of Elizabeth her coming face to face with local folks at the opening of a who knows what. The work, as royals call it. Imagine meeting the queen. Untold thousands have. We loved the queen with her corgis. We liked her wearing wellies. We smiled when she smiled. And she smiled a lot when she watched a horse race if she won. We were there when Her Majesty visited Washington, D.C. in 1991. The sometimes stuffy and self-involved city went gaga. Not a cynic in sight. Not bad for a monarch in a town and a country who long ago made it clear monarchy is not our thing. Really? For Sunday Today, Harry Smith, New York. A legacy that will live on forever. Thank you for joining me this half hour as we honour the anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's passing. I'm Keir Simmons. See you next time on Today All Day. you probably went apple picking over the weekend and if you're thinking what am I gonna do with all of this fruit I'm sure you are so many apples we've got some ideas Jetila is here leading our master class Monday to teach us all about the different varieties of apples the best way to use them hi Jet hey what's happening uh, Savannah or uh, Jenna or say she's Bob Anyway, Bob, that's yeah. really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Sorry, She's known as Bob. <laughs> I'm that's Bob. What, you can call me Bob. Oprah calls her Bob. Yeah, just Oprah. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's that time of year, right? It's apple time, October, kind of all the way into 
<clears throat> January. Uh, you probably went to pick apples and you saw some at the store. Uh, I just want to take you through them on which ones to eat, which ones to cook yes. with, which ones can kind of oh, do that's both. Good to know. Can we just start I with cutting and have, peeling? Yeah, go ahead. Though? Can we cut and peel first? Because we don't know how to Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. Let's do that. Everyone should have one uh, a peeler. There's many different kinds. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the kinds that have a little serration on them. Uh -oh. So here's a little bit of serration. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not doing anything fancy. Uh, I, I, you know, it's like a game for me, that's right? Fancy. I try to do. That's very fancy. Try, no, it's not. Oh, you, you got guys, a bruiser on that one, though. One of these. And you didn't take oh, you the sticker that? off. I like that you didn't waste no. time. You're just going straight in. What do you oh, do why? if you get a bruisey apple like that? You, you bake it. You know what you do? You, you bake it very good. Or you just cut it off. You take a little piece and you go, chip, just oh, like that, wow, and it's gone, cool. right? And it's like a game. I try to make sure I that's get all, good. you know, get it all in one, mm -hmm. and, you know, then my kids can. Anyway, we compost that. Um, so that's how I cut and peel. Another tip I have for you is um, the way I get the most out of an apple is uh, I'll peel it, I'll cut it in half, and check out. Here's a really good tip. I take a teaspoon, uh, and I'll actually use the teaspoon to remove the core. Oh, look and at the that. The, but look at that. Check it out. And I get the most amount of apple that way. Oh. I Somebody get zero just said waste. wow in our studio. Somebody that oh, very rarely very says wow. Anthony, was that you oh, over yeah. there? I actually impressed someone in there. Um, I'll cut this two ways today. So we're gonna do, I'm actually, I've made a apple compote, kind of a warm uh, a cinnamon brown yeah. sugar apples that'll go over a Dutch baby. And then we made a savory uh, situation, um, making a little bit of stuffing for an apple roulade. Uh, but I think we should talk about tasting apples, yeah, right? Okay. Um, so I break them down into two general categories. Uh, tart and crisp is good for cooking and you have a honey crisp uh, not a hand crisp, but you have a, a, a Granny Smith yeah, granny. there, and that's green. Granny, it's one of these green, so granny guys. is what we should cook with, right? I want you to cook with these, and look, I mean, look, I don't want to tell people what to do. Really if good. you love tart, then you do it. But I cook with Granny Smith. No, this is the best cooking apple, really crisp, right? Really tight. Um, and then next to you, you'll probably have a Honey Honey Crisp or a Red Delicious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, granny Smith, tight, tart. Uh, red delicious, kind of mealy, good for snacking. The snacking apple, mm -hmm. and in between there's a Fuji, and a, and there's Much so many snacking. new varieties out there. Mm -hmm. um, so what so, about a so gala? that's a gala is uh, one of the uh, number of top five apples in the world. Oh. That's kind of good to go both ways, like a honey crisp, Who ranks these uh, but apples? also good for snacking. Um, you know apples. what? We we kind of just take the <laughs> info. Yeah, apples. Jet fuel is appleinfo.com. We kind of rank. Uh, just go by sales information. Oh. And they also come in these little ones. I put these in my kids' um, lunchbox every day. So you have okay. a snacking, a big size and a little size. Cute. Um, so. So yes, yeah. another thing you can do is you take the apples, you cook them down, and look what I've made. I've made a pork roulade here, yeah. and what I've done is I love apples and pork. So I've taken uh, the apples, I've taken cranberries, some 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 dressing there, and I'm show you how that works. So here's the piece of pork loin. Uh, you take the pork loin, and here's the dressing that I made, and, and you basically either uh, cut cut the uh, pork loin into a sheet, or you can actually just use a mallet if that's easier for you. Uh, you want to leave a little uh, room on the edge. And all we're going to do is I like to use uh, parchment paper yeah. uh, so I don't really have to be making too much contact. And look, I'm just lifting smart. and rolling, okay. lifting and rolling. And I haven't even touched the pork. Yep. Check that out. So wow. you tie that. You tie that with a little bit of butcher twine. This is fancy. Um, I brown. I roast. It's really not that hard. Uh, the nice thing. And then you make one of those situations. Um, another really fun uh, deal is I actually take the apples and I cut them bigger and then just butter like butter and brown sugar and cinnamon makes yeah. everything mm. more delicious. So I love uh, a Dutch and then, baby too. Oh, and if you've Dutch never had a Dutch baby, delicious. guys? Yeah, I love a Dutch it's baby. It's just like a large pancake. So take your Dutch baby. It basically poofs up in the oven really oh, big. Nice. And then I'm going to take the apple. Look at that. Look at that apple. Uh -huh. um, the warm Look at apple that. Over there. Over ice cream, though, that'd be yes, good too, right? You had me with Dutch oh. baby, Jet. This looks so delicious. Right? And then, uh, you know what, how you finish is always really important. So a yeah. ton I of agree powdered with you. sugar, ice mm -hmm. cream, whipped cream. Yes. Um, there it is. Go out, pick Jet. apples, eat apples, find a new variety every day, and then play with it and eat it. Thank you, Jet. Thank we you well. so much. <laughs> this morning on Today Food, quick and easy cooking is the name of the game. Mark Bittman is the best-selling author of over 30 cookbooks, and now he's out with a revised version of how to cook everything fast with all the recipes in the book, which everybody's raving about, by the way. Thank you. You're my favorite host. I what love can it. I say? Yay! All right, um, so we're gonna make ham okay. biscuits. Drop biscuits. Drop biscuits. You think they're hard? Most people do. I do. They're not. I mean, dough and all that's a lot. Right. So, so dough is flour and baking powder and baking right, soda and salt and pepper. Okay. You need chilled butter. Okay. That's um, a secret. 
Check, check, and check. Could be frozen even, okay. really. And um, you which, just want to. Oops. Blade are you using? You, you just want to use blade? the regular so steel blade. No oh. She's like, which blade are you using? I'm over here, like, okay, just push on. This is kind of chop that up. All right. And then you put. Do you have this to is have buttermilk. Do you have to have a... I mean, you could do this by hand, but we are trying to talk easy, right? Minutes, so. I actually have one. You of don't have one of those? No, I'm proud of myself. I have one. And then you do it. this no until it looks like this. <laughs> okay. okay? Done. And then you can use an ice cream scoop. You can use two spoons like to shape these, yeah. but I do this. Yeah. Oh, you don't have to roll it out? Or you don't have to do anything. So that's, that's why thing, they're called I drop I biscuits. I assumed it was, you know, you know having to beat you know, it and all drop that. Drop biscuits. And you want to keep them small because... They, they cook faster, mm. and then they stay beautifully crisp okay. like this on the outside. Okay. This is just a mixture of mustard and jam, That's apricot jam, Wait, you chutney. Mix mustard and jam? And then you get mm. this. How is that, guys? It's delicious. So I good. mean, they're raving the about it. They are raving. So you do. Mustard. Is that a thing, mustard and jam? Yeah, it's, it's a, a thing. thing. It's a thing. That's right. a Bittman sauce. It's his thing. Any kind of ham or no? Well, any kind of good ham. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on okay. to the next thing. I'm going to try this while you start on that. So the next oh, one yeah, is apple. Good, or something. good. You eat a biscuit. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> oh! I know, right? Eat a biscuit. This that is, one's good when you smack somebody's arm. I apologize. It's good, right? So good. Mm. All right. What are we making so now? this is diced apples. Okay. I like to leave the skins on, actually, but these are off. But but uh, honey crisp and golden delicious. The but they can one. be any mixture. Okay. And you're going to saute those. So the idea of this is it's an apple crisp in two pans. Okay. So much easier and faster. Okay. While that's cooking, you add a little water so it doesn't burn. Just a little burn. bit of butter and that's it, right? While that's cooking, we make like an apple crisp topping. How do we do that? So that's, let's do it in the right order. Okay. Oats. Check. Into the butter. Nice. Into, this is a fair amount oh, of butter. I know, you know, it looks so delightful. Oats. It's not low fat. Walnuts. Not walnuts. Okay. Coconut. Oh, okay. Coconut. That's what it is. Brown sugar. You guys didn't oh, see the sugar. taste of coconut in there? We're having another biscuit. This mm. is. What is that, cinnamon? Yep. All right. And just a little Woo! bit of Got that one. A little bit of salt. And then just. Cook that until it's crisp, until it's like that. Okay, this is what it's. So that's like. basically granola, so right? I bet you this by itself is delightful. Mm -hmm. I bet it is. <laughs> oh, have you tried this by itself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he has. Yes. <laughs> this is dangerous. Before I even get to the apple on top, I that's the problem. I it's make good. an apple crisp and I just eat all oh, the crisp. Oh, that's good. Right, and so this is that. yeah. You know, we're gonna we're gonna eat this afterwards, Mark, so fantastic. we got to do this. Okay. And so you wind up with something that looks like this, like this. Mm -hmm. or something that looks like this. Oh, wait a minute, there. Can I and, try it um, now? <laughs> it's your show, you, you know. <laughs> how long do you um, do that? I mean, this is like five minutes, oh, seven. Oh, so quick. Yeah, yeah. Mm. We're going to cook this. You got 30 this cookbooks? So, this is why you have 30 cookbooks. <laughs> Do you know what would go so well with that cup of coffee you're having right okay, now? I know, I know. A oh, breakfast taco? What? No. A slice of warm, buttery oh, apple pie. There is nothing more classic or comforting this time of year. So we asked Maya Camille Broussard, she's the owner of Justice of the Pies, to share her best pie-making tips. Oh. Take a look. Oh, my. We have three cups of flour. 
Then we're going to add some granulated sugar, some kosher salt, and we also need 16 tablespoons of really, really cold unsalted butter. And we're going to cut the butter into the flour. What you want to see is pea-sized shaped pieces of butter. And that butter is going to steam into the crust and pop up, and that's going to make it flaky. I always start off with a little bit of water, and then I add as I go along. All right, so once all of that comes together, then we essentially create a disc. And the disc is about 13 ounces. We're going to wrap it in a plastic wrap and put it in the fridge to chill for one to two hours. Just a little bit of flour on top. Roll away from your body. Lift it up and roll away. And then you're going to turn it. When you lift it up and turn it and roll away from your body, you're making sure that the crust doesn't stick to the countertop surface. Now we have to make the apples. So I have about six or seven apples that I've sliced, uh, cored, and peeled. We're going to put in cinnamon, ginger, and nutmeg granulated sugar, cat light brown sugar, uh, all purpose flour, and then I'm going to work that in with my fingers, or you can use a silicone spatula or a very large spoon. Then I'm going to add in some lemon juice. I'm going to take one tablespoon of butter, Put it into my saucepan and then I cook the apples until they are pork tender. So we have our pie shell that is lined with one disc of our crust. I'm going to take the apple pie filling and we're just going to simply put it into the pie shell. Now I've got my crust that I broke out earlier and I am just going to simply Roll that on top of the pie crust. See how easy that was? Then we're going to take the edges and we're going to roll and tuck. Roll and tuck. And then I take my finger and I'm going to push like this. So push to crisp your pie crust. Then I'm going to take knife and I'm going to cut some bits on top of the pie crust. It's a very important step because your pie crust, because of the butter, is going to pop up and it needs space to uh, release the steam. So that's a very important step. But this is my favorite step that I love to do, which is the last step before I pop it into the oven. I have uh, one egg and then I'm going to have one tablespoon of water and then I do a egg wash. So once I've done the egg wash, I am going to place it on a baby sheet and put it in the center rack of the oven. Another tip is that I really don't want you to miss is to place it on a baby sheet so it can catch all of the juicy juices that may fall. I don't like to clean my oven, so I'd much rather clean a baby sheet than to clean my oven. So I have a beautifully glazed egg wash pie, and then when I take it out of the oven, Just I ate am. a whole apple pie before 10.54. Worth it, Maya. Worth every calorie <laughs> to get Maya's recipe. Head to today.com slash food. We'll be back right after this. Delicious.
peak apple season, mm. folks. So we're going to celebrate this morning with two delicious apple treats this Superfood Friday. Today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bauer is going to show us how to make apple fritters and also a fun spin on caramel apples. Joy, mm. always good to see you. Take it away. Hey guys, first let me say I love apples so much. They're crispy on the outside, juicy on the inside. Depending upon what variety you have, they bring all sorts of different flavor profiles, right? And they're loaded with nutrition. So we're going to start with a healthified version of apple fritters. And I'm holding an apple here. The first thing you do is you're going to core it right down the middle, okay. turn it sideways, and we're going to slice it into thin, I would say about an eighth of an inch pieces. They're circles. Let me show you what this looks like, just like this. Oh, right. And so here I have a pancake batter. Oh. And so I'm using a whole grain, but you can use any kind that you have in the house. And Neither did I. <laughs> so I'm going to dip it right in. Oh, that's easy. Whoops. Right? The apple and the oh, my goodness. Hold on a minute. I got to get another piece. Even here we Joy go. Joy Bauer's just like us. I know. <laughs> Joy Bauer messes up. And so. All you're going to do is put it right in a heated skillet, okay. and you let them sit for about two minutes on each side. And you have two options here. You can either make, I'm going to show you, I have, I have a skillet right over here. Mm -hmm. You could make pancake-like pieces. Mm -hmm. You could see the, the apple peeking through over here. Oh, or good. if you want to poke the whole of the apple, you could make it more so like a little apple ring. And now... After they're all done, I'm going to bring you over to my island because I'm going to show you how to put the icing on the oh, cake, or I should say the icing oh. on the fritter. Oh, yes. Does it cook yes. when you do it two minutes on each side? The apple still cooks enough? Yes, and this is what I would tell you, and that's a great point, Chanel. If you take a bite and you find that the apple is a little bit too firm, uh -huh. just lay them out on a plate and put it in the microwave for about 30 to 60 seconds because ideally what you want to get is this doughy goodness on the outside and a gushy, soft, oh, sweet apple on the inside. Yeah, and that's what they look like. Mm. So now I take a little bit of melted butter, oh. and all I'm going to do is spread it on the top and a little bit of sugar, or you can oh use sugar gosh. substitute if you want to pull back in a little bit of ground cinnamon. And that's it, guys. You make, It makes a great big bunch, and it's really delicious. Yeah. And I so hope everybody loves Joy, them. Joy, you also have your own take on, and I'm not surprised, caramel apples. You make a caramel sauce at home? I am so excited about this recipe, and it's a caramel sauce you could feel really good about because I cleverly use dates. I'm taking dates. Uh which have natural sweetness. You put them into the blender. There's no corn syrup in this, and you don't need the stove either, which makes me very excited. So I add a cup of boiling water, and what that's going to do is soften up the dates. You let it sit for about 15 minutes. Again, it's going to make the dates much easier to blend. Then you remove about half a cup of water. It doesn't have to be an exact science, just some water. And I put in some maple syrup, a little bit, oops, a little bit of vanilla extract, mm -hmm. just about one teaspoon. And then this is really nice. If you could find it, this is just maple extract or maple flavor. You whirl this up. I'm just going to show you what this looks like. This is caramel sauce. Oh. This oh. is caramel sauce. And now we're making sheet pan caramel apples because we're going to take this over the top. So this is what it looks like when it's yeah. done. Beautiful. But so you take, you line your apple slices up, and then all you do is you put the caramel sauce over the top and all sorts of toppings, chocolate chips, melty chocolate. Look, I have coconut in the middle. You could do walnuts, pecans. Joy. I mean, it's a party. Amazing. It looks delightful. delightful. Oh, it's Jinx. a party. Thank you, Joy. For the rest exactly. of these folks, Bye, guys. have a great Bye. weekend. As always, it's today.com slash food. Alejandro Ramos is here with comfort foods mm. to warm us up as it gets cold. This mushroom kind of freaks me it's out It's kind of fun, bit. right? Yeah, it's a it. yummy yeah. one. It's a yummy mushroom. What's great about this is you can use any kind of mushroom. So you can use the classic button mushrooms mm -hmm. or go for something a little bit fancy like an oyster or mm. shiitake. You can get the oh, mix. Mix it up. Yeah, and so all you want to do is you kind of want to do a nice little rough chop on these, right? Doesn't mm -hmm. have to be anything They break perfect. down quite a bit when you cook they them. They break down a lot. So you're, use, you're going to see it's all these mushrooms are going to go in there, okay. but that heat is going to pull out all of that water. Okay. Uh, also, when you're adding, you know, like a little bit of olive oil and salt, that pulls out all that water. Okay. So you have in here. Here is just, we've got some carrots, some onions, and some celery, basically mm -hmm. the base of your dish. Then you add your mushrooms in, right? And I'm okay. going to cheat. I'm not going to do all of them right mm -hmm. now because it, 
It does need time to cook yes. down. And then once those mushrooms cook down a lot, then you add the garlic. You don't I think I've overcooked yes. my garlic because I well, think I've been yeah. putting it in with it. Exactly. You don't want to do the garlic at the top because then it can burn and it yeah. can get bitter and then that flavor is going to be in yeah, the whole uh, the dish. And, right. Okay. And chef, this is like very hearty, right? So it's good for fall? Yeah, it's a great fall dish. And what I love about it, it's like mushrooms are... They're meaty, right? So they're mm. really satisfying. And I love that they're just really filling. And you can add other things to it, too. So if you've got leftover rotisserie chicken or you want to add a little bit yeah. of Italian sausage to it, go ahead and do that. I love it vegetarian. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. And it's all in one pot. Once too, the veggies nice. are cooked, you add some flour. This is oh, going to help thicken it. I was wondering. It. Yeah, so that's what it is. That's going to thicken it. So, okay. uh, sure. Dylan, if you want to give it like a little bit of a mix there. All right, so then flour. We're doing some chicken broth. Chicken broth. Mm. And then you can do, this is optional, but you can do a little, um, like a little sherry. Mm. Or or a little brandy. Oh, okay. It adds a nice flavor to it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is just going to great. Ooh, this smells great. For, I mean, it already smells yeah. great, right? It smells, it yeah. smells like fall. It smells it like cozy yeah. times. Uh, and then you're going to add some great herbs. Okay. So here we've got some chopped up rosemary, some mm -hmm. sage, some thyme, all those wonderful winter herbs. And then this is my little favorite trick. Mm. Is so this? this is nutmeg. Okay. A whole oh, nutmeg. Okay. You can buy the ground. I was just buy it in the thing. I know. You can do I mean, yeah, totally go for it. And it lasts forever. It's fun. You, you like, like grate it in. Right. That goes right in. Okay. And it adds this wonderful little sort of touch of like subtle warmth to it. Oh, we got a minute left. We got yeah, okay, so it gets really nice and thick. And then you put your puff pastry right on top. Everything is in the can pot. Can we try this? Can we try Please try it in. Yeah. Talk to us about the dessert too, though. So the same same pastry? Exactly. So yeah, so then over here, now I've got a dessert version. So you can use either store but pie crust or puff pastry. Okay. And this is an apple pie empanada. Oh I grew up Ooh. eating empanadas for everything. We basically just put everything in dough. Yeah. Uh, right? You've taught <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, <laughs> and this dish is like, think of a, of a McDonald's apple pie, but yes. way Except, better. Exactly. Very similar. Very yes, similar. Exactly. Oh so there you go. It's okay. like a little, it's the a McDonald's apple pie with a Latin twist. To another level. Level. Doesn't it just, it just totally elevates oh my those goodness. flavors. <laughs> food shopping until you see this next no, dessert. Because our pal Dono Skian has a beautiful apple crumble cake that your family will devour. Now, we can't wait to see this dessert you're going to cook up for us. So what are we going to make? We're going to make an Irish apple crumble cake. The book is filled with family classics and there's a whole dessert baking section in there that celebrates the sort of things we want to cook around this time of the year. So we're going to make up this Irish apple crumble cake. And the first thing you got to do is soften down your apples. So I'm going to take some uh, peeled, cored and diced apples. Pop in a little bit of water. There's a hot pan over here. Um, a little bit of water. They're going to stew out. And we're going to literally... Oh, that's a very hot pan over there. <laughs> we're going to stew them out with a little bit of sugar and basically cook them out until they're really nice and softened down. And what you should be left with is something that looks like this. It's still holding its shape a little bit, but it's gone sweet, soft, and mushy, and gorgeous hey, Donald, things are happening in Donald, here. is there, yeah. I mean, I know there are a million kinds of yes. apples out there. What, what do apples you like? should we use to bake? I always get nervous when I say this in America, but do you know what a Granny Smith is over there? Yes, we, we love do. Granny. <laughs> Go with the Granny Smith. It's gonna okay. be gorgeous in here. Okay. It's crisp, it's dark, but it's still got a bit of sweetness, and it's gonna be lovely in this batter. Now, for our batter, I have creamed together some butter and some sugar. I've added my eggs. I've added a little bit of flour in there as well. And we're going to get that stewed apple in 
alongside oh, a little bit of flour. And now, of course, it's fall. We're thinking of Thanksgiving around the corner. You've got to go with a little bit of cinnamon spice in there. So go as heavy as you fancy here. It's really something that works well with apples. Okay. And for a little bit of rise, we're going in there with our baking powder. We've got a little bit of flour as well. And basically, you're going to bring that batter together. It's quite a dense but sweet mixture. Yeah. And it really is a foolproof recipe. Like a lot of the recipes in the book, this is about getting results and making sure that if you go to the trouble of cooking, you're gonna get a seriously gorgeous result. So with this cake batter, once you've mixed that through, the moisture of the apple is gonna get in there, the cinnamons, mm -hmm. all those great mm. things are gonna happen. You're gonna pop that into two springform cake pans, uh, cake, cake tins with a little bit of parchment paper. Mm -hmm. It's gonna bake off for about three, uh, at 325 degrees Fahrenheit for about 40 minutes wow. until a skewer is clear. Um, and beautiful. then you're going to have the four ingredients that bring together this cake. So I have my cake that uh, is slightly iced. For our icing, um, you make up a very simple batter. Um, oh, it's just a buttercream frosting. I pop that on top. But the finishing touches of this are the crumble that we're going to create. So wow. I've, put, I've, pre I've just, with my fingertips, pushed together some flour and some butter. To this, we're going to add some chopped hazelnuts yeah. and then a nice bit of sweetness in the form of some brown sugar. So get that in there, Love get that mixed through, sugar. and this is going to go into the oven as well. So you get this gorgeous sweet crumble mm. mixture that's going to go beautiful over the top of that. So that's our topping into the oven, get that baked off, and you should have something that's crisp Can and crunchy see? and oh, gorgeous wow. to face Wait, over the you top. You bake that you stuff. You bake it. Ah, okay, got it, got yes. it. Yes. Yes, and it's sweet and it's crisp and it's crunch and it mm. adds that, you know, because you've got a dense sweet thing going on over here. You're yeah. talking about textures and flavors. And the other thing we're going to do is slice what up is some more Granny Smith, soften it down with some butter and some sugar and a little bit of water. And then you get these beautiful little strands that are going to be part of our decoration on top. Oh, but cool. when you have your buttercream frosting, yeah. the trick here and what gives a beautiful sweetness is dulce de leche stirred oh, cream. Oh, are you with me, ladies? Dolce are you with me? I love that. So what do you do to so, make that okay, dulce de leche? Look at that buy it. Don't don't make it. Don't even worry about it. Go Just and bake. Go it. and buy it in the Just store. This it. is Thanksgiving. You're up your ears it already doing things. Tired. You don't want to be making those to that day. It's an easy one, but you know, at the same time, let's take the shortcuts that we need around this time of year. So we're gonna finish the cake with our frosting that's spread over the top. Mm. Those lovely little apple strands, they're gonna mm. place in and around here. So you get a bite of sweet apple in every single slice. And then we're gonna to top it off with our finishing layer over oh, the top. Show us. So, Look at Place that. Place that on top. Oh. And then literally you build, you build, you build until you have something that looks as phenomenal as this. Now, can you imagine your oh Thanksgiving God. table no, landing that? We can't, that Donald, we the really deck. can't. That is beautiful. <laughs>to kick off our show today we will introduce you to a few intrepid women pioneering across the sea and sky in november 2024 the artemis 2 rocket will take a trip around the moon we got an inside look at this historic mission from a nasa astronaut who's made history in her own right christina cook is used to being the only woman in the room and come next year she'll be the only woman who's headed to the moon when she embarks on the artemis 2 mission planned for november 2024. but that first is just the latest on a long list going back to when she was named an astronaut a decade ago a phone call she remembers well and i actually started out by telling them, hey, it's okay, I had a great time interviewing. Thanks for considering me. And they actually had to interrupt me and say, actually, we're calling to tell you we want you to join our team to come to Houston. Since that day, she set records, like the longest single space flight by a woman with a total of 328 days in space and participating in the first all-female spacewalk.
What was that moment like, going out with all women? Yeah, it was it was incredible. Hopefully that got people thinking about where we're at. We weren't just out there for participation ribbon. We, we wanted to actually be excellent spacewalkers. This isn't very well known, but the coolest thing about that spacewalk was it was unplanned. It was the only spacewalk I did that was not planned prior. I never trained for it, she never trained for it. We actually went out to fix something that had broken. So we designed the entire spacewalk in one week with the teams on the ground. And normally a spacewalk is developed for years. Along the way, she's faced obstacles unique to women in the male dominated field. The fleet of suits is actually built for a bigger bodied astronaut. So I go out and do spacewalks in a suit that's two sizes too big for me. There actually are time factors that they add in for how much longer tasks will take in someone who's doing a spacewalk in a suit that's too big for them. Are there things about your job that you think are changing and will change and will continue to get better as more women do this? Definitely. In fact, the suit is a perfect example because the next suits that they're making for the moon surface operations are actually going to, by design, fit a very wide range of people. Among your many accomplishments, adding another one, the first woman on a lunar mission. What was it like to get that news? It was great news. Funny story, we were actually all late. No one was on time to this meeting. We had a meeting put on our calendars under a different pretense, so none of us had any idea how important this meeting was going to be. We were asked, how would you like to fly on Artemis II? Uh, when, you know, after walking in and seeing the people in the room, I knew that it wasn't a meeting I should have been late to. <laughs> but um, after kind of regaining my composure, you know, it took me a second to take it in. I said it would be an honor. and and we'll try not to disappoint you in the future by being late. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be on time and they'll be uber prepared. Cook will be a mission specialist on the 10-day Artemis II mission that will send four astronauts around the moon on the Orion spacecraft. The team is currently training on a simulator Cook is seeing for the first time with us. This is our sim and it's just getting ramped up. And this is the first time the seats have been installed and we have software up and the displays are, are on. When we're on that far side of the moon is when we will probably be executing something like this. There we go. Oh, so there we go. The moon. Yep, yeah, the moon is there. This is the dream come true of any astronaut. It's still exciting every single day that we get to come and do training in this mock-up. The crew is taking courses in this exact replica of Orion. This is my seat, oh, so you're no. going to be sitting in my seat. Okay, that's, that's great. I claim this spot up here, that's going to be my sleep spot. We'll be laying on our backs facing okay. up, and when we start to actually accelerate, we'll have that feeling of acceleration like this way, like kind of being pushed back in your chair. When you think about so. that moment, nerves? Are you scared? <laughs> Are you excited? What's that particular moment feel like? The moment that you actually lift off. Honestly, if I could assign one word to it, it would be the word fulfillment because wow. you finally realize you are fulfilling the mission that you came here to do. Now to the incredible story of a military trailblazer. Chanel Jones caught up with the first ever black woman to become commanding officer in the 106 year history of the Naval Station Norfolk. So this is the world's largest naval base. Correct. And you are the first African American woman to be made commanding officer of this base. What does it mean to be the first? It means that I'm not the last. I always takes the first and after that, it's game on. Game on is right. As commanding officer of Naval Station Norfolk, Captain Janet Days manages nearly every aspect of the base, home to the U.S. Atlantic Fleet with over 56,000 military personnel, 63 ships and submarines, 18 squadrons, and an average of 1,150 ship movements per year. It almost feels like a small city. Think about it as being a mayor. Everything from managing the infrastructure, the supply, the utilities, all the support services, not to mention the operational component and the personnel that come to the space. How'd that go? It went well. So one of the people who inspired you to pursue a career in the military is your dad. Absolutely. As a little girl growing up, and your dad's an army man, I saw how people responded to him, and so my dad had a huge influence on me joining the military. Raised by a single father, when he was deployed to Vietnam, Captain Days and her siblings were temporarily placed in foster care until he returned. And you know, you realize, and even for me as a parent, the love that he had oh, for you guys, it out. Oh, and the sacrifice it out. that it took. And being in the army was a means and a way for him to provide for us. All right, thank you. 
You served as the Destroyer Squadron and aboard USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, where you did two tours for Operation Enduring Freedom, including a deployment to Afghanistan. I served on board destroyers. That would have been unheard of uh, back in the early 90s because these ships, they go to combat. Today, 30 years later, women serve in multitude of capacities in the Navy. Captain Days gave me a tour of Norfolk's naval ships from the patrol boat. Put this in perspective for me. This is the world's largest naval base. Yeah. Never ever is there not activity and action happening here 24-7. Ships come in, we repair ships, we supply ships and do upkeep, we do training. Our stretch and our reach is wide. How do you move forward and navigate in a world like this when you don't see anybody else blazing those trails? I had wonderful mentors. They just weren't women and said, you would be great at this. Do you even think about it when sometimes you're the only one who looks like you in a room? No, I'm so used to it. Attention on deck. Yes, I see it, but it doesn't bother me because whatever my purpose is for being there, I'm gonna do my job. Her impressive resume includes being the commanding officer of the USS McFall, a warship, and says there were challenges along the way. You've had moments where people would question and say, you know, who's in charge here? And you say, I am. I did have an instance where the pilot boarded the ship, went over to my executive officer and said, hey, Captain, are we, we ready to get underway? And I heard that and I said, we absolutely are. We're ready to get underway. Let's do it. He turned beet red. Don't believe it was intentional, but I think it's just the norm. Now, over a month into the new job, Captain Days is still getting used to the attention and says young African-American sailors often ask to shake her hand. They want to shake your hand and they say you're super proud of you. And it's taken a little bit for that to kind of sink in. And women, women of all hues, who come up and shake your hand and they hold your hand and they don't let your hand go. Mm -hmm. I want to make my family and make those proud. And also just let ladies know that you can do it. Oh, ladies, you, <laughs> you can do it. We are so pleased to have you here on the plaza. What an honor it is for us to be sitting with you. Chanel, what a great interview you have with her. <laughs> Will you just put your finger on the moment when mm. you knew that your life was about to change, you were about to be in charge and at the helm? No, it was absolutely amazing. I have a fantastic team at Naval Station Norfolk, and you don't just get there overnight. Yeah. You know, it's a path that you take as you go through various tours. You have advocates, um, people that are rooting for you, and, and the amazing team that works with you. It's absolutely a team sport. Um, but taking command of Naval Station Norfolk is probably the epitome of my career, aside from commanding a warship. I wanted and, to ask you about that because, yeah. I mean, you truly have risen through the ranks in every sense of it. But commanding a warship, we were just talking, you are saying, in a lot of ways, that is the highlight, the mm. pinnacle. No, absolutely, absolutely. The Navy puts an enormous amount of um, just the responsibility on you, but trust that not only are you going to execute the mission, but you're going to bring those sailors home and you're going to take care of them. Mm. And that right there means absolutely everything to me and commanders that are afloat, commanders that are in squadrons, commanders that are on submarines. Um, the nation's um, children are a responsibility. Mm. And sure we can go out and accomplish that mission and take care of them, that is absolutely um, it's something I'll never forget. Still to come, a few fun educators who've gone viral for their creative approaches in the classroom. Stay with us.
to the Boost. With the new school year now well underway, we are celebrating some standout educators. First up, Dylan headed to gym class to meet an award-winning teacher who also has quite the social following. Thomas Gilardi, a physical education teacher, has taught for the last nine years at PS 173 in New York and is affectionately known as Coach. Oh, we got a tie over here. Why did you want to become a phys ed teacher? I was always passionate in anything that I did, and I always gravitated towards sports. Soccer was really my game. Once I figured out I wasn't going to be a pro, I'm like, what else should I do? And I realized I kind of had a gift working with kids. Like, if I wanted to make them laugh, they'd laugh. If I wanted to make them do things, they'd listen. And I'm like, this is kind of fun. Coach is crushing it. The 2022 Elementary PE Teacher of the Year, who also happens to be a hit on social media. Hi, my name is Coach Gilardi. Creating the Phys Ed Zone in 2018 to help strengthen students, mostly through dance movement. After watching kid-friendly exercise videos online with his class, he thought, I can do that. I got a tripod and an iPad, and I did it. And I put it on my own YouTube channel. Welcome to the Phys Ed Zone. More than 22,000 YouTube subscribers and more than 5 million views later, Coach lunges and kicks, claps and jumps to encourage children's health and fitness. Are you ready? <laughs> Two hands, same time. Where did the ideas come from for the movements and everything you're doing? I started asking the students, like, which songs do you want to hear? And I would just kind of say, let's do some free dancing to it. I'd watch them. And then I'd go to my basement and practice in front of the mirror. So these videos started before COVID? Yes, I had about 25 dance videos. And then COVID happened. Yeah. And everyone had to figure out remote learning. So now I went from teaching my school my community, now I'm teaching everywhere. It was unbelievable. You got it. What do you see in him as a teacher? He really thinks about where phys ed's going to take kids. It's not just a job for him. He really what? is looking to inspire kids for their futures. Why is it important to get kids to play as part of exercise? We're living in a day and age where there's so many other options to avoid being fit. I see my students once a week, maybe twice at best. I know I'm making an impact, but what real impact can I really make in that short period of time? Mm -hmm. Has been really my biggest challenge. On the flip side, Coach educates the next generation of PE teachers through TikTok. Tips for PE teachers. Where he has 74,000 followers and more than 3 million likes. Give it a try. Why did you want to do that? The best way for PE teachers to be prepared to teach is mentorship. So now they have their degree, they're applying for a position, and now they're teaching with really no skills. Why not share basic tips and tricks to help these future professionals? Time for me to get in the phys ed zone. One of the tips you have is a hula hoop hut. Yes. Can you help me make one? Of course. <laughs> I did it! Yeah! Yes, you're a good teacher! Finally, I get to join in imaginative fun and games with Coach and his students. No equipment needed, just a willingness to play along. First activity is called Look Away. There are lots of whistles. Free. Hopping and laughing. One foot? That's crazy! What? I can't do that! And the real crowd pleaser? Think rock, paper, scissors, plus a flexibility and balance challenge. Banana split. Oh, no! Okay, I got this. Banana split. No! We found another educator who has students bubbling with excitement, a chemistry teacher with his own viral following, thanks to his fun and creative approach in the classroom. When I got into teaching, I did not think I would become a dancer in the chemistry lab with my students. Every week, Professor Andre Isaacs and his students are conducting research. So what are yields looking like? And learning choreography. All right, I think I can do that. You got it. The Associate Professor of Chemistry at the College of the Holy Cross is fusing pop culture with science lessons on TikTok. The reaction? More than 480,000 followers and more than 4 million views. As an elder millennial, I don't think my body moves the way in which Gen Z's um, do. And you know, in that moment, we're kind of flipping the switch, right? The student became the teacher and the teacher became the student. 
Can somebody come five, six, seven, eight under their breath when she pulls me in? His videos often feature an experiment. I'm going to take this rosé and I'm going to turn it into milk. A history lesson? Let me introduce you to African-American chemist Alma Hayden. And a trending dance. Complete with his popular rainbow lab coat. 80 degrees. 65, actually. 65. But it's not all play. We spend a significant amount of time doing research, and in our downtime, we, we like to create videos. For Professor Isaacs, engaging his students through social media has strengthened his bond with them. They come into our classrooms and they have to make themselves vulnerable about their, you know, intelligence, about, you know, what they know. But that doesn't happen on the other side, right? The faculty member doesn't have to be vulnerable. It was so important to students for me to have like a growth mindset to remind them that I believe in them. They can do this much as my students said, I think you can handle this stance. And that's been kind of a, a guiding principle because now the, you've been, you're more vulnerable with, with their students and so they trust you more. The whole point of the dancing is to meet students where they're at in whatever way ways they need. As a black and queer scientist, the professor is using his platform to create more interest and inclusivity in STEM. I think for a lot of students, seeing someone who holds all these intersectional identities thriving in the space and, and having that sense of belonging is, is really inspiring um, a lot of younger folk. Professor Isaac's mentorship and fun approach to chemistry is what drew his students to the subject. He sees his students and the people in his research groups as true people and really tries to kind of cultivate their interests and passions and what they want to do beyond chemistry. Chemistry in, its, in of itself is difficult and just being able to do chemistry while having fun uh, is something to really enjoy. And for the chemistry professor, that's what success looks like to him. It's very important for us to realize that science can be conducted by anyone, right? And, and it doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't matter how you identify. I want students to realize that their, whatever they bring is an asset, right? And that science is better when people bring their, their unique qualities and skills to the table. But as far as his dancing goes... He is a little bit of a slow learner, but he is a great dancer. For now, Professor Isaacs is encouraging the next generation of scientists to step into their element. All right, let's do it. Showtime. When we come back, the photographer on a mission to spread more than just smiles. Stay with us. here on the booth spotlighting the power of a picture. Let's take a look at how one photographer is helping a unique group of people 
take pride in who they are. Can you give me a big, big cheese? A cheese. The saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Griffin. Right here, Griffin. Hey, buddy. For Texas-based photographer Philip Flores, who formerly served yeah, in the Marines, right the these smiles have become his mission. <laughs> Last year, Flores founded Down for Smiles, a not-for-profit organization focused on sharing the joy, beauty, and ability within the Down Syndrome community through free professional photos. I hope to give them a voice. I hope to give them hope. I love you. It's a labor of love inspired by Flores' four-year-old daughter, Isabel Grace, the father of two. You have a beautiful smile. Look at you. Now focused on sharing the stories Three, two, one. of people with Down Syndrome You're gonna give that to me? through his lens. I saw the beauty and the capability, all the possibilities that Izzy has, possesses, and exudes. And I wanted to show that. She's a, a light of our lives. His photo shoots have taken him across the country, bringing him everywhere from baseball fields to ballet studios to bakeries and to places like Gigi's Playhouse in Sugarland, Texas. We just keep looking at each other. And all to capture his subjects. Is that strawberry? Chocolate? Where they feel most at home. Three, two, one. For parents like Alice Sims. Who's your favorite singer? Down for Smiles is a difference maker. It brings confidence in the children that are taking those pictures, and then it shows the world, you know, the beauty that is Down syndrome. Three, two, one. Giving her 17-year-old daughter Haley the confidence to shine. Three, two, one. Wes and Amanda Hudson. Somebody get tickled right now, hurry. Our grandma and grandpa to 10-year-old Sadie. Give me a big, big, silly smile. Flores' photos help honor their special relationship. We've just always thought she was one of the best miracles in our life. It's a great idea. And then ready, three, two, Look that way. right here, buddy. Right here, Bubba's. The power of each picture celebrating the beauty you cheese? and abilities of individuals both inside and out. <laughs> Our community is beautiful and it's glorious and it, and it deserves to be a screened from the mountaintops and celebrated. Now we want to shine a light on an organization that's been making dreams come true for nearly a decade. Ruby's Rainbow provides college scholarships to students with Down syndrome. And Al got to sit down with the Ruby who inspired it all. Introducing Ruby Plakta. 11 year old Ruby Plakta loves an introduction. Her mom, Liz Plakta, is her biggest cheerleader. The minute I held Ruby, I knew that I, I needed the world to see what I saw in her. Ruby was diagnosed with Down syndrome the day she was born. I always say, joke that she came early, tiny, and rocking an extra chromosome. As a new mom on this unexpected journey, Liz was determined to understand everything she could about her daughter. Quickly, I just, like, shut all the books. You went on, on being mom. I did, and I let I let her, you know, be my guide. She's been the coolest freaking thing ever. I wouldn't change a single hair on your head. I love that. Uh, Mom. <laughs> With this newfound perspective, Liz started planning ahead to help Ruby thrive. I was so interested in, like, her future. And about six months old, I looked at my husband, and I was like, I... I think I want to help somebody with Down syndrome go to college. I'm going to help them, you know, go for their dreams. In 2011, Liz and her husband, Tim, created Ruby's Rainbow, a nonprofit that gives partial scholarships to adults with Down syndrome wanting to pursue higher education. 11 years later, Liz has created a community of believers raising hundreds of thousands of dollars every year for Ruby's Rainbow. We gave out 119 scholarships this year, which was a record for us. We gave out, it's crazy, isn't it? We gave out $483,000 in scholarships, which wow. I want to cry just thinking about it. I got it! I got it! Scholarship from Ruby's Rainbow! Oh. Congratulations! Well, we've given out 599 scholarships. That's over $2 million in scholarships in the past 11 years since this little lady's been born. Recipients go on to complete college programs, a few even getting their associates and bachelor's degrees. 
and one is going for her master's. The confidence and the life skills that they're gaining just by being allowed to go out into the world and make mistakes mm -hmm. and learn from them. Like I mean, everybody. It, like everybody. Today, Ruby is in her first year of middle school and flourishing. <laughs> Ruby, what are your favorite things? I like to be in band. What's your instrument? I play a trombone. Ah, I like that. <laughs> but she's already looking to the future. Hey, Ruby, do you want to go to college? I do. What do you want to study, Ruby? I want to be a doctor. She loves getting her blood drawn, so. <laughs> oh, wow, Ruby, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't either. I do. <laughs> Above all, Liz understands how believing in someone like her daughter can change a life. It's an honor for me to help other people with Down syndrome be the wow. best of me. Ruby is the gift that keeps giving. You are the gift that keeps on giving, Ruby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. After the break, another inspiring and fun story that's sure to put a smile on your face. Stay with us. the boost with that one last feel-good story you cannot miss. Check it out. Sometimes it can be kind of tricky to keep young kids on their best behavior when you guys go out to restaurants, but it was not a problem for the little girl you're about to see. In fact, she was all in. I don't know, maybe it was the queso. Uh, the girl is feeling it. Feeling it. I'll have what she's oh. got. She's got a flamenco dancer thing. She's got a basket of chips. Oh, Nobody's keeping her happy. That looks like Jenna oh, Bush Hager when she was little. Yeah. Eating queso for the first oh, time. That is funny. Spot on. Oh, Spot that's on. Beautiful. That's I love cute. it. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for another fun day here on The Boost. We love being able to help lift your spirits each and every day, right here on Today All Day. Thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential here on Today All Day. I'm Vicki Wynn. We're back with more insider tips and the latest consumer news. From warnings about knockoff weight loss drugs to what you should consider before buying pet insurance. It's all coming your way. But first, I'll look at new technology that aims to make school buses safer for students. This is video from a school bus in North Carolina. Watch as the students on the left attempt to cross the road to board the bus, but then are nearly run over. And this Ohio bus driver hailed as a hero after saving a student from being hit by that car. 
These incidents are known as stop arm violations. A new survey estimates this happens more than 43 million times every year. These stop arm violations can have deadly consequences. According to a government report, 13-year-old Evelyn Gurney was run over and killed by a driver in Wisconsin as she prepared to board her bus. The report stated the stop arm was deployed when the driver swerved around it and struck her. But new technology aims to make it safer for students by enabling buses to communicate directly with cars. I'm here in Indiana at the test track for IC Bus. It's the nation's largest bus manufacturer, and I'm going to show you for the first time how it all works. It's called Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X for short, and it's being developed by dozens of automakers and tech companies, including Audi and IC Bus. It just takes safety to the next level. With me is Justina Morrison from IC Bus. The bus driver slows down and extends the stop sign. Heading toward us is a car also outfitted with CV2X technology. That screen alerts the bus driver of the approaching vehicle. Near my vehicle in motion. As the car gets closer, the technology senses it has not slowed down, once again warning the bus driver, don't let kids off that bus. High speed vehicle approaching. What is that screen telling the bus driver right now? It's telling the bus driver how fast the car is approaching, how close the car is to the school bus, as well as from what direction that car is approaching the bus. So we saw how this tech works on buses, but what about for drivers of other cars who really need to know where those kids are? With me is Palm Mohotra from Audi to talk about what the experience is like behind the wheel. Palm, how will this prevent crashes? So the technology that we have in the Audi e-tron actually communicates directly with the school bus up to 10 times a second. And it doesn't matter if the driver in the vehicle is actually able to see the other vehicle hmm. or not because it can look around corners, it can sense a vehicle through an obstruction like another vehicle. And this is how we prevent accidents on the road and save lives. Let's see how it works. This time the bus is stopped, but I can't see it because it's hidden from view by that semi-truck. As I approach, I get a warning on my dashboard. Wow, so Palm, I don't even see a bus or any stop signs, but already the car's telling me something's ahead. Exactly, and it's telling you, heads up, you need to slow down. Okay, let's see what happens when I don't slow down. And there's the warning. It gives me an extra time to react, and that can be the difference between life and death. Absolutely. We try it again, now with the semi-truck behind the bus as I maneuver to pass it. This is a very real scenario. A big rig slowed down in front of me, I don't see anything, so I'm just gonna change lanes around it, but. I'm already getting an indication. There's a school bus. Now I'm getting the stop indication. And if I don't stop, there's that alert. And I had plenty of time to stop. And CV2X isn't limited to buses and cars. It can be used to alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles, upcoming construction zones, bicycles, even pedestrians, as long as they're equipped with the cellular technology. But the safety benefit that it delivers on the road is incredible. Incredible safety when everything on the road can communicate so we can avoid scenes like this. The technology is not exclusive to Audi or Navistar. Nearly every automaker is working to get this into their vehicles as quickly as possible. Audi says they're hoping it will be standard technology in their vehicles within three to five years. Now, if you think that's a long time, the FCC actually set aside the bandwidth to make this all possible all the way back in 1999. Next, drugs like Ozempic are being used for weight loss, and recently, more websites have been selling knockoff versions. But are they safe? These days, it seems like everyone is looking to shed a few pounds. Baby, the hype is real. But as the craze for using diabetes drugs for weight loss grows, so too is the emerging market to get so-called knockoff versions of these popular medications, all without a prescription. A new report by the Wall Street Journal found more than 50 websites selling semaglutide and terzepatide, the active ingredients in diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Anytime demand vastly outstrips supply, entrepreneurs will step into the breach. While nearly all of the websites have disclaimers that the ingredients are not for human consumption, the journal found some had instructions for how people could use the substances on their own. They're not verifying who you are and they do things like prefer to be paid in Bitcoin. The paper also says at least 18 of the sites have run ads on Instagram and Facebook in recent months, including ones like these from SAF Research, offering huge gains and a buy one, get two free deal on their vials of semaglutide. 
Facebook and Instagram's parent company Meta says they've removed ads for the sites on their platforms after being flagged by the journal. Telling NBC News in a statement reading in part, our policies prohibit the advertisement of prescription drugs without the proper authorization and approval. On its website, SAF Research offers numerous disclaimers stressing their products are not dietary supplements, but instead research chemicals for laboratory use only. But some are choosing to ignore these kinds of warnings. Across the websites they reviewed, the journal found that a month's supply of the ingredients cost around $100 to $200, compared to brand name drugs like Ozempic, which can cost around $1,000 a month without insurance. Lori Sicatello says she was prescribed Ozempic for her type 2 diabetes last year. Months later, she hit an insurance coverage gap, making it too expensive for her. They said now it's going to be $754. So she began taking research-grade semaglutide that her friend found online for about $100 a month. What's really in this? What am I, what am I taking here? By the end of the month, I wasn't comfortable with taking it anymore. The FDA is now sounding the alarm about the potential dangers of buying these ingredients online, saying in a statement that they advise consumers to not purchase peptides marketed as sold for research use and mix, ingest or inject them. There are no FDA approved generic versions of these substances and drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly say they don't supply their ingredients to companies selling research substances. Earlier this year, our NBC News investigation found more than a dozen telehealth websites advertising Ozempic for weight loss. I experienced firsthand just how easy it was to get these medications online at a low cost. Met my request. I had my Ozempic prescription by the very next day. My producer also got a prescription. This is Jamie. No one ever saw us on video or in person, and neither of us has diabetes or would be medically defined as obese. While it may seem like it's becoming easier than ever to get your hands on these drugs, experts say doing so comes at your own risk. I really advise patients to steer clear of the online versions because we just can't control the quality or the safety in those cases. The Wall Street Journal tells us some of the websites they contacted have already been taken down. We reached out to SAF Research for additional comment. We have not heard back. The website says they use different marketing tools to reach their audience and that none of their ads make claims that could send the wrong message about their products. SAF also emphasizes they do not sell supplements or medications. With so many counterfeit options, Novo Nordisk actually launched a website, semaglutide.com, to help people spot the difference between what's real and what's fake. Coming up, is pet insurance really worth it? How to decide if it's right for you. Plus, tips to help college students eat healthier on a budget. Welcome back, Americans. We love our pets, and more owners are now getting pet insurance. But it can be confusing to figure out if it makes sense for you. We help break it down. We love our pets like family. An estimated 111 million American households have a dog or cat. And just like any member of the family, health care is important, but an emergency vet visit can cost between $250 to $1,600. 
It's prompted a booming business in the U.S., pet insurance. The number of policies purchased at the end of last year has risen nearly 93 percent since 2019. It's another kid. You know, I have three daughters and I have Lucy. You got her as a puppy and immediately you thought, this is a good idea to have insurance for our pet. Why? Well, just like you would insure your children. You want to make sure, you know, if something bad happens that they're protected. Jeff Foose purchased a policy from True Panion, among the nation's largest pet insurance companies. He says his coverage started at $33 a month for Lucy. But after nine years, the cost has risen to almost $80 a month. That's a 141% increase. Foose says in some years, his rate increased more than the 20% his policy said it would never exceed annually. Do you think this was a worthwhile investment? Absolutely not. It can be hard to tell if pet insurance is worth it for you. We requested quotes from five popular companies using Bruno, a three-year-old mixed breed dog. For similar coverage and a deductible between two to $500, take a look at the rates. Embrace at the low end at $41 a month, Trupanion the highest at $167. None covers routine exams. We would absolutely recommend that you get your insurance when you have a puppy or kitten because that's when a pet doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. Margie Tooth is the president of Trupanion. The company brought in almost a billion dollars in revenue last year and says it's paid two billion in claims since the company was founded in 2000. We asked her about Jeff Foose's case and other complaints that Trupanion has raised its premiums to unaffordable levels that are far higher than vet care inflation. You said it's important to your company not to make consumers feel like it's a bait and switch, and yet we have talked to some who feel like they're not getting what they were promised. How do you respond to those criticisms? It's very disappointing to hear that people feel that way. I think we, we work very hard to ensure that we're explaining our value proposition and that we make it clear to people when they sign up with us that your price may change. Do you think there's enough regulation to make this industry uh, transparent and to help consumers really understand the pricing models? I do not. I think it's changing. I think it needs to continue to change more. It's a bad financial product. Kevin Brassler is executive editor for Consumers Checkbook, a nonprofit providing price research and consumer advice. In the case of pet insurance, we found that overall, compared to the payouts and the premiums you have to pay and all the other out-of-pocket expenses, they're generally really bad deals for most pet owners. Do you think it's a better idea to set aside some money in a rainy day fund rather than paying these premiums? Yeah, I mean, you're going to do far better off financially in the long run by taking those premiums that you'd pay to pet insurance companies and just saving them and taking care of your pet's costs out of pocket. If you want to buy pet insurance, Brassler says check accident only policies to cover emergencies like car accidents or poisoning and look for a higher deductible plan to lower your monthly payments. Foose says he would have been better off with a rainy day fund. If you had just paid out of pocket for Lucy's incidents, mm -hmm. would you be ahead? I'd be ahead of about $2,300, $2,400. We reached out to Embrace. They told us their policies provide peace of mind and like insurance for homes, cars, and people, pets should be protected too. Up next, healthy and budget-friendly meal ideas for college students. And later, a look at what's fueling the growth in popularity of stick chips. Consumer Confidential continues after this break.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. College students, they're not making the grade when it comes to healthy eating. So I hit the grocery aisles with a chef who specializes in healthy and budget-friendly meals. With nearly 3 million freshmen expected to attend college this fall, many students will live on their own for the very first time. A fresh taste of freedom served with a full plate of new responsibilities. Gail Cresci, a registered dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Children's, says as first-year students adapt to college life, some may struggle to maintain a healthy diet, a time I remember all too well. It was a lot of pizza, it was a lot of cookies, it was a lot of eating late at night, and a lot of contributing factors to the so-called freshman 15. Where are some areas that calories like to hide and sneak into a first-year student's diet? We find hidden calories in things like alcohol. Another area is with coffee. You may get some of those extra syrup flavorings, a whipped cream that's on those coffees. We see a lot of extra calories with fast food. What are three things you might advise a first year student when it comes to eating healthy? Avoid eating late at night if at all possible. And you're going to be hungry during the day, so have some healthy snacks available that are quick grab and goes. Another thing is to make sure you're drinking adequate water. Cresci also recommends eating 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which equals about three ounces of chicken breast or lean beef. This is where you live when you're in college. We've called on chef, TV personality, and senior food editor for Budget Bites, Monte Carlo. Monty, class is in session. Yeah. Clearly we got the assignment. You're Kale University. Okay, School of Hard Knocks. Yes, I'm representing University of San Francisco. So you say that when kids are off on their own for the first time, mm -hmm. often cooking on a budget, you got to start with an A-plus grocery list. You have to start with an A-plus grocery list. And the best part is it's a really cheesy, easy one. Let's go. Let's start with fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's important to eat nutritiously, yes. but this stuff is expensive and it doesn't always last a long time. No, it doesn't. This has the life of like a Disney star. What, like 24 hours? But the best deal for you when you want berries in your life is to go frozen. These fresh blueberries cost about five bucks a pound, but for the same price, you can buy three times that amount frozen, adding them to oatmeal, yogurt, or smoothies. Let's talk about packaged produce. Yes. What's your tip here? Do not do it. It's a no-no? No, come on. You're gonna pay like five dollars for poor little pieces of corn when you could buy this for 59 cents a pop, right? Ah. Just peel it, bro. It's not that hard. And right. if you have a microwave, you have fabulous fresh corn. Carlo, who teaches college cooking classes, says when it comes to appliances, every dorm room or apartment also needs a coffee pot. You can use it to make soups. You can use it to make eggs. Anything that you would stew or heat up in a pot, you can make in a coffee pot. <laughs> The next part of our lesson, a study of hot deals on frozen meals. A staple of college life is pizza. pizza. But you don't want to be dialing that pizza delivery company. No. One pepperoni pizza is $17. You can get three for $10. Carla suggests stocking up on a variety of store brand frozen vegetables to use as pizza toppings. It's starting to feel kind of gourmet. Okay. Or as a way to help another college classic earn some extra credit. Are you ready for the pop quiz? I guess so. Which country consumes the most ramen per person per year? USA? No! Vietnam! Yes! We love our ramen. Costing three bucks for six servings, Carlo partially cooks the noodles and divides them into mason jars with the veggies. When you're ready to eat, you add a little water, a little broth, you put it in the microwave, and you're set. So you just pre-make these ramen jars? Yes using your noodle to find a cart full of savings. Winning. Class dismissed. Ah! For other budget-friendly tips, consider shopping store brands and downloading the store's app for extra savings. Also, shop the less popular cuts of meat, like chicken thighs or sirloin tip steaks, and add beans to meat dishes for more bulk and protein. Now, let's switch gears to the recent growth in popularity of stick shifts. I hadn't driven a stick in nearly 20 years, so we found the best instructor to rev up my skills, a NASCAR champion. Drift, slide, side to side. But before we get into my skills behind the wheel, let's revisit that time in 2019. When Dylan and Al taught Craig and Chanel how to drive with a manual transmission. I didn't even feel you change it. Because I'm that good. As for me in 2023, you decide. Let's take it for a spin.
right, all right. So that's not exactly how it went, but I was in for some fun. Today we're outside City Field here in Queens, New York, and this this is the brand new Mustang Dark Horse. It is a manual transmission car. I can't wait to take it for a spin. Problem is, the last time I drove a stick was 15 years ago. But lucky for me, look who we have here. NASCAR Hi. driver, Coca-Cola 600 champion, Ryan Blaney. Hi, thank you so you? much for being here. Yeah. So there is a rise in interest in these manual transmission cars. What's the appeal, Ryan? I feel like... The appeal of manuals is it kind of makes the driver feel one with the car. You're engaged. It, yeah, that's a great word. It makes you very engaged with the car. So I'm really excited to show you around it. Okay, so you'll stay with me as I kind of like go oh, through yeah. the bumps. I got you. <laughs> All right, let's do you. it. All right. I'm the first TV journalist to drive the dark horse. I know, tough assignment. What is the first thing I should be thinking about? So first thing is left foot in on the clutch. Okay. As you're letting your left foot off the clutch, and you know, your right foot's going down to the gas and it's like on an even motion. So a lot of people kind of dump the clutch and that's when you get like the big perky jerky. Did you bring a bar bag? Yeah. There we go. All right, all right. You know, it's like riding the bike. I'm picking it back up again. Yeah. And you know what? This, I have to pay attention when I'm driving a stick. There's no time for texting and being on the phone. Your right hand's working, your left hand's on the steering wheel. You're not gonna be on your phone, right? While stick shifts accounted for 1.3% of sales in the U.S. in June, searches for new manual cars are up 13%. It's a bright spot in an otherwise downward trend. In 2000, more than 15% of new and used cars sold by CarMax were manual. By 2020, it was only 2.4%. Compare that to electric vehicles, which now make up 5% of car sales. Let's switch gears and have you show me how it's really done. Okay, yeah? let's do it. <laughs> but before we do, Ryan revs up the settings on the car. Ooh, you put it on some sort of race flag mode. We're gonna have some fun. I'm excited. You can't do worse than I did. I actually went off the track. Woo! Yeah, here we go. So what mode are we in right now? Woo! Super fun mode? Yeah, super fun mode. <laughs> what do I smell? Is that rubber? Yeah. <laughs> That was like real life Fast and Furious, Ryan. Yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that on Definitely. the roads. But we were here, we were safe, and I'm happy you had fun. Ford's manual transmission Bronco is also seeing a spike in interest. There's a lot more people ordering them, and you can definitely tell that they're getting, becoming more popular. Autumn Schwalbe is a future product planner for Ford's performance cars. She says aside from the fun of driving a stick, manuals can be cheaper too. On average, stick shifts cost nearly $1,800 less than automatics. What are your friends saying about manual transmission? I do know a lot of people that are super willing to learn at my age. As for me, I finished in victory lane. I didn't have to do much teaching, so I was, I'm was i just happy I just get to sit here and ride. Best journalist driver of the day? By far. <laughs> your check will be in the mail later. <laughs> Up next, a mom creating diverse and inclusive dolls for everyone. the heels of Barbie mania, there's renewed interest in dolls. And I recently met a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. Barbie.
Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Miniland's dolls representing children with Down syndrome. And Mattel's fashionista line, featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year, while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. Yeah! <laughs> American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Max says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or 400. Um, we started out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles and it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're gonna see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at The Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And that's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit style Coney in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal 
has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see you again. It's been a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis, setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're going to go into the hot dog business, but we're going to top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. Is we that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? 
It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America, and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learn how to make the quintessential cone. One up! Right there, nice shot. Yeah. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vi vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of Coney's. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing, yes, it's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and a and That's lamb. That's right. 
And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's they, what we were talking. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to... I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that... Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, it'd be mm -hmm. cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime. Nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom, okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. Nice. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means one. I need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it, chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. A little All right, more. that's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go with it. you want the in. chili to go Yeah, in. you want the chili. You want it, yeah. I want that chili. Don't chintz out on that chili. Don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier for uh, you to pour over there. All right. It. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. Yeah, mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. They are a nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer Bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. 
In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal, they're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid-80s. This summer, we're going to be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family and family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family owned business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together. We, you know, we get down in the dirt. You know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of 
product that we're sending out each day from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night. I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth, just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool county spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan coney spot in the coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. 
So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior, to reflect like my basement or my living room where you could come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. It just tastes so similar to it would as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you're know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, that's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This the chili? is Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good, especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us. But it's been tough, yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. And a good Wednesday morning to you. We are following that chaotic scene in Philadelphia overnight. Looters on a ransacking rampage, and this is a growing problem. It's September 27th. This is today.